Hey everybody, it's Aldo Gandhi, and I just want to let you know really quickly oh, really that quickly, our yeah. swag shop is reopened. DeepDishTees.com is where you go, and that's tees with T-E-E-S. Clever name, guys. They're the new home of our merchandise. You can get t-shirts, you can get caps, you can get coffee mugs, you can get hoodies, you can get all sorts of good stuff, and you'll help out the bar room with the purchase. So head over to DeepDishTees.com. You're listening to the Ballroom Network. The following program is intended for all audiences. Welcome to the South Burbs Hitmen Podcast with your hosts, Joe Mandel, Stephen Zim Zimmerman, Vinny Parisi, and Chris Gonzalez. We're bringing you the White Sox coverage you need from the perspective of true Southsiders. Grab your Comiskey dog with an ice cold beer and meet us at section 155. Everyone get on your feet for your 2021 South Burbs Hitmen. That ball hit deep. Way back. You can hit on the board. Yes. Jimenez in the air. Left field. He's your hero tonight. Thanks, Cubs. Over the head of Jenks, Uribe charges, throws, out, and the White Sox have won the World Series. Alexei! Yes! 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 History! A perfect game by Mark Burley, and what an unbelievable, unbelievable play by Dwayne Wise. First pitch starts now. What is going on, everybody? And welcome to the South Burbs Hitman Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Joe Mandel, and I'm joined by my White Sox brother in arms, Chris Gonzalez and Vinny Parisi. Uh, and gentlemen, we have a very special guest. We're not going to waste any time bringing him on. Uh, we're bre- we have a great guest. We're so excited. It's James Fegan from The Athletic. He covers the White Sox. Uh, James, thank you so much for joining us, man. We're, we're happy to have you with us. That was an elaborate intro sequence. That blows away anything Liam Hendricks has walked out to this season. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate it. You know, it, we we, we got to get the people amped up before they come on, you know. <laughs> but uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Uh, you know, you, of course, you cover the team with The Athletic and – you know, to put it lightly, this team is the talk of Chicago right now. You know, how exciting is it to cover a young, thriving team that, you know, they're on top of their division when all the other teams in the city are underperforming? You know, what's that like right now? It's weird, man. Uh, when I started this uh, job in 2017, we did like two or three prospect trips a season. Uh, it's weird to be in August and I'm not like in Winston-Salem or something like that or uh, – you know, talking to some draft pick, it's been kind of a pivot to really focus on like, you know, the major league team as much as I do right now. Um, you know, someone like Zach Collins, I've been interviewing that dude for like five years since he was an A ball. So um, it, it's strange, but uh, you know, it, it, it's definitely you don't feel ignored the, the way you used to. Um, sure, I, I think uh, like uh, the athletic has like this national news desk and whatnot. Um, and, you know, for the first few years of my job, like, you know, I never talked to them at all because like they never cared, but like I was, I was aiding them on a, a write up of the Sebi Zavala three home run game, like the other day. And I was like, I, I didn't think anybody outside of the White Sox land would ever be talking about a Sebi Zavala. So it, it's crazy. Yeah, no, I can't even imagine huge game on Saturday. Of course it was a full house over there. It has been a lot lately. But, uh, you know, of course, the trade deadline was one of the most active in league history this year. You know, the biggest trade, of course, was the acquisition of Craig Kimbrell, uh, who looked lights out in two innings pitched so far. You know, what are your thoughts on giving up Nick Madrigal and Cody Hoyer for him? Uh, you know, obviously it's a gamble um, in the sense that, you know, it's definitely very much playing in the next two years and treating them as, uh, you know, very precious and uh, essential, which – Honestly, I think probably White Sox fans are really ready for that in the terms of uh, just the front office treating like an individual year as, you know, taking priority as much as kind of we've been spending the 
last half decade thinking of the long view in terms of those things it, it seemed to them be re, being very much valuing uh you know what can you do for me right now so you know I've, i think the world of like uh, cody Howard's talent um going forward and obviously i've been covering nick madrigal for a long time and been talking about his potential to be like a very special bat and i still still think that's possible but they're just in a situation where these are guys who are not very useful to you in the media in the sense that um, you know, Cody not having a good year, you can't really, you know, t- start talking about him being a guy you're going to hand like the seventh inning of a tie game or a one run game in the playoffs to the way he's pitching uh, over this year, even if you think, you know, he's probably a tweak away from being, you know, the guy he was last year again. And Nick Madrigal, like, I think, you know, the way even Rick Hahn said it at the time when he went down is that his performance kind of dict- continued to validate the idea that he was the second baseman of the future. But at this point, you're talking about a guy who's had two major injuries around 80 games played. And yeah, he's probably, he's one, you have this whole second base without him, but you start to maybe get a little bit more skeptical of what, how much he's really can provide that above average production over the course of the next five years. And maybe that makes you a little bit more willing to take the, the leap that they did. But, um, you know, it is a little bit of like White Sox in the sense that they tend to make these big splurges and get top of the market guys at positions they can afford. You know, you're not going to see them like spending three hundred million dollars to like sign the best shortstop in the game or the best center field in the game or something like that. When they go top of the market, right. it tends to be reliever or you know DH like Adam Dunn all those years ago uh, to get a guy who's still at the level of position where they can afford when they go top of market. So it is a little bit that, but otherwise, I think it's kind of re- refreshing to, uh, to see them kind of immediately. Uh, really go all out uh, to, to fill a need with an elite guy to someone who can make a difference maker. Uh, you know, the, the thing that fell the teams in 2015, 2016 was just trying to get the the skeleton of a contender and hoping everything breaks right and, and goes good. And, you know, I would say that they needed two relievers of this deadline, um, but they could have added to pair and felt like, all right, we've upgraded the bullpen and be done. Um, the fact that they went all out and they went to the top of the market, you know, that, that, that speaks highly of them and that, that should be encouraging to people. Yeah, no, it definitely is. It has that all in feeling. I'm with you there, but uh, to piggyback a little further on the trade deadline talk, you know, one of the reasons this year's market was so active is because of the uncertainty coming up with the collective bargaining agreement. You know, I'm curious, do you have any thoughts on that and the potential for a holdout and a strike in, in the future? <sighs> I don't have like unique insight in terms of like, I'm not like privy to like sure, sure. Tony Clark's negotiations or whatnot. Like every time I talk right, to right. like, you know, people who are involved, like Sox union reps, like Tim Anderson, Lucas, she Leo, they're all like, yeah, we all know we, we want to avoid last summer. We want, we want a deal. No one wants a lockout. We know it's really bad. And, and fundamentally, I wouldn't think that the White Sox signed like, or traded for Ked Krimble because they, I don't know how much I just butchered his name. But stuff. Craig Kimbrell. Um, <laughs> it's all good because they thought like there's going to be a stoppage next year or something like that, or like they can't forecast the next couple of years. I think that's just about them being, you know, aggressive the, and, you know, within the framework, you know, people, the White Sox front office like takes it personally when you imply they're not aggressive because they feel like they're very much, uh, they are, but it's within oh, the sure. framework of the, bu- the budget of that they get. So they're both in the aggregate, the team looks not aggressive because they're always kind of staying within this limit. But the White Sox front office believes like we're doing the most of what we have all the time. It's kind of their mindset. Um, I think they're just kind of they're being aggressive within you know the, the room that they have, and they think like, well, this team you know has a clear path to the playoffs. Um, they have a you know it's kind of a down year in the sense that there's not like a big Goliath team uh, in the AL. Certainly um, in the NL, you can maybe hope and pray that, you know, the Dodgers are going through a North tumult that, um, you know, they're maybe not at their peak either. Um, so mm-hmm. I, I think it's more about them seeing an opportunity competitively than I think uh, it's about, you know, labor uncertainty. But I, that may be something that we, we wonder about how aggressive did it make them in terms of like extending their pre art players and not getting anything done um, this, this spring training. But uh, even that's kind of a black box to really know how much it's truly affecting it. Um, sure. I, I think, I hope, because it probably affects my job in the long run, <laughs> that yeah. people kind of take away from what went on uh, trying to get the 2020 resumption done and how ugly that was and how much that didn't help the sport in trying to work something out for this. But obviously it's the two sides that really deeply distrust each other and view everything in bad faith. The number of players that I talked to like who really kind of believe that Pete Alonso's conspiracy theory of like they adjust the balls 
um, based yeah. on like the free agency class every year was like not encouraging because <laughs> it's like, wow, mm-hmm. they must really be like not trusting the owners to believe something like, you know, whenever there's a conspiracy, I usually you look at incompetence as the answer and not like people executing a grand conspiracy. It's more like MLB does not know how to like properly maintenance the balls and have them consistent year to year than they like are really good at mm-hmm. it and controlling it very specifically every time. It's more like they're just not in control of what they're doing and like they have these way too wide performance standards and whatnot. So um, to cut off a really rambling tangent, um, I don't think it <laughs> has too good. much effect on, 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 on this market. I think it's just they see their window now and you know this, this roster is going to get more expensive in these coming years. And yeah, I don't think that's an excuse for them to not do anything, but I think it also probably should provide some motivation um, for them to act now because you're going to have guys like Mankata, Anderson, and Amenez start getting the raises in their extensions and get out of the super cheap portions of the extensions. So the time for them to kind of load up um, with maybe guys they can't afford or Kimbrell's $60 million option is probably now and next year more so than it is down the road. Yeah, for sure. And I think I speak for all White Sox fans, and we're, we're excited that they're going all in. And I was just curious about the whole uh, holdout, but we'll guess we'll see what happens when that comes up. But uh, to bring it back to baseball right now, you know, the city will be split again this weekend, you know, with the Crosstown series beginning. You know, what storyline, you know, are you kind of looking at heading into this weekend? You know, you got Kimbrough going back, you've got Tapera going back. Uh, the Cubs don't have any other major stars beside Contreras. I'm just curious where you go as someone covering covering this, where your mind goes to immediately. Uh, for me, most immediately, I think, I mean, in all likelihood, Eloy is going to be back Tuesday. He's supposed to run the bases on Tuesday. He's been doing everything fine up until that point. Um, Luis Robert, it was his rehab extent will literally expire by the Minnesota series. I would suspect more likely that he's back in time for that Wrigley series. Um, so the Cubs are so like diminished right now in terms yeah. of uh, just the, the roster they're trotting out every day. They just like, they cored out like absolutely their lineup going forward. And, you know, I, I don't think there's like, you know, I guess probably they made friends, but Craig Krimble, Craig Krimble and uh, Ryan Tapera were there for like really a hot minute. It's it's not like this huge like uh, reunification thing, you know. It's only Cody Hoyer who's really active uh, out of all the guys that the Cubs acquired. It doesn't seem so much like uh, the meetup of the trade as much as the White Sox coming into full strength, and it could be you know an opportunity for them to kind of display it and flex their muscles against a team that's really kind of factored it in for the rest of the year. So I think. The thing I think about at Wrigley Field is more so than like your cross sound trades that they've made or anything like that. It's just like you you could be a situation where you're finally seeing Eloy and Rod in the outfield again, and you know they're going to be against a team that really is now bottom rung with the way that they are uh, oriented at least this year. You know they could spend a little in free agency now with the budget they cleaned up, and maybe they won't be quite as a doormat as they are these last two months. You know next year, but it. I don't want to hype everyone up, but like it could be a situation no, I, you just see the White Sox blow out the Cubs for like a weekend and think like, holy crap, they're really great and they're going to do everything. Um, so yeah, I, I'm assuming everyone's going to be way too excited by the end of next weekend. <laughs> I know I can't wait for that. Hopefully, fingers crossed. But I'm going to toss you over to one of my co-hosts, Vinny Parisi. Vinny, why don't you take it away? Yeah, thanks, Joe. James, thank you so much for joining. It's really nice to meet you and have you on the show. Um, sure, no problem. The White Sox, you brought it up earlier. You brought up Kimbrell and the trade deadline and Tapera. They join, you know, Michael Kopech, Aaron Bummer, all of it. How do you see that incredibly talented bullpen taking shape the rest of the season? Where would you slot guys, certain situations, eighth inning, ninth inning? What are you thinking on that front? I mean, mostly I wouldn't be super strict about it. Um, like, yeah, I guess you have a bit more flexibility if you think of everybody in terms of just like an inning and maybe you don't have to have them down as long, but – uh, I feel like it should give you the creativity to really do anything. Like the fact that Tapera has gotten knocked around like the first two times may, gives you a little bit of pause, and maybe you want to see him in medium leverage uh, going forward until you like have him back on the right footing. Now he's with the new org, but uh, mostly it's just that eighth inning on, you can either go to Kimbrel or Hendricks. Um, it seems like Tony's a bit more traditional uh, in terms of like he's probably going to pick up preference and stick with it. 
So once he showed his hand, a little bit of Kimber working the eighth to Hendricks working the ninth, that's probably what I would expect going forward. But you obviously have nights where, you know, if you work Hendricks back to back or, you know, three days in a row, then you have, you can turn it over to Kimbrell and you can extend either one of those guys to two innings if they're fresh. So I think that you'd see a lot of alternating there. Um, and then you also have Michael Kopech, uh, who could someone pretty much pitch the seventh or eighth inning at this point. Um, you know, I don't really have a big concern of him after his last outing since both he, La Russa and Zvala were pretty clear that they felt he was tipping the entire time. I would see, you know, him and Bummer kind of trading off for seventh and eighth. Maybe you turn to Bummer in situations that are a bit more left-handed oriented. And that's kind of your main setup group uh, with Tapera, you know, giving him some opportunities, sixth or seventh or medium leverage to kind of build in. I think Jose Luis is someone you're pretty comfortable with low and medium leverage. The, the opportunities that kind of give him a little bit higher order opportunities have not gone great. He's doing really well and the statistics look really shiny. Um, you know, when, when he's, you know, operating low leverage and facing the bottom order. But I, I think you promoted him and saw what happened enough times that you don't have to really push it. He's great there. He's out of options, you know, just kind of don't mess with him uh, type of situation. And then, uh, you know, from there, you're kind of hoping to see, you know, Evan Marshall get healthy toward the end of the year and, and maybe that offers something, but you're no longer in a situation you're really relying on that. And, you know, as much as I am like a big, you know, convinced that Evan Marshall, when he's healthy, when he's right, uh, you know, is a quality like seventh, eighth inning guy. Given the way he struggled this year, given the fact he's been hurt, you really just don't have the need to push him anymore. So I wouldn't do it. But I, I think you have like four guys. God, I knew I was forgetting something. Gary Crochet. They've been, um, his command is not spotty enough that I, I, maybe this is, this is the biggest benefit that you can really kind of be more, you know, democratic about where you put him because they've really been kind of switching and throwing him all over based off, uh, you know, seemingly nothing. Sometimes it's been mop up, sometimes in matching up against lefties. Uh, you know, sometimes he's, you know, seems like the designated 10th inning guy, which doesn't seem like a situation is really suited to him either. Um, I, I think you could just play a lot more matchup with him and, and have him be the second lefty. Uh, I know that doesn't seem like a great use of the 11th overall pick, but you know, I think you're really in position now, uh, especially with the seriousness that you've communicated with the bullpen about being contending, where think of him less as, you know, we're developing towards the long term and, you know, he's 11th overall pick. We want to use him in super high situations and just this is a guy who's really good at getting lefties out. Um, let's use him when we purely have matchup situations that, that dictate it. Not so much pushing him for length anymore and just kind of putting him in situations to succeed, but it kind of remains to be seen. For sure. Michael Kopech, like you said, tipping his pitches a little bit, according to Zavala and La Russa, who I trust. I agree with you on that. And it's it was just weird because we're not used to seeing that from him at any point this season. He's been so good. He'll go get six outs and four of them are strikeouts. But do you see him staying in the bullpen? I know we kind of went through just now what the outlook of it is, or do you think there's a chance he starts a couple games down the stretch? Uh, I'm not seeing any leaning towards that. Every time we've asked about that, uh, I know it would achieve the larger goal of wrapping up his innings for next year, which I still think is probably increasingly like important for them because this is a team that, especially if you're you know taking Hans word at it, that they are going to pick up the options for um, you know Kimbrel and uh, Hernandez. You know that could easily take you to kind of like a hundred fifty million dollar payroll um, next year without even factoring in many additional you know signings which would be great. The White Sox should spend money. They should expand their payroll. They should go 180. They should go as high as they are. But knowing that that's likely not like an outer bounds that they're going to go to, um, it's important for them to kind of replace a rotation member at a really low cost. So Kopec achieves that. So, But even with that obligation, you know, Tony has given every indication to continue to think that he's like super valuable portion of late any mix. And yeah, if I was just worried about winning the 2021 World Series, I would look at Kopech and say, like, yeah, that's one of my best setup guys, and I'm going to use him as such. So that seems like what they are geared towards, at least what Tony has repeatedly said. So the fact that they've had a spot start and they just tried to extend Ronaldo, and not only did they extend Ronaldo for more innings, but it went really well, makes me think that it's going to just continue to be a feature of when they're looking for rest down the stretch. They're probably going to, you know, extend out Ronaldo for three to four innings. You know, maybe involve Lambert more again since, you know, he didn't blow up this time, though. I would say Ronaldo was a lot more impressive yesterday, you know, just the stuff and uh, the way he got through his innings than Lambert was. Um, 
but I, I think that gives them the flexibility to further not feel like we need to use Kopech for these spot starts. And, you know, Tony's really kind of limited to one or two innings since pretty much, I want to say June. So it, it seems like what they're leaning, that's leaning, what they're leaning towards doing. Is Lance Lynn the most interesting cat you ever interviewed? And if he is, where does Liam Hendricks fall on that list as well? Liam, I would, Liam has like, Lance is like obviously very, you know, cool. <laughs> right. Um, but Lance is like on brand like all the time. Like the, the free Britney t shirt was probably the biggest like curveball. Everything is just like You're right. Every, everything else has been like just the platonic ideal of Lance Lynn. So he's not like, Whoa, I never thought he'd say that. Liam Hendricks is just weird things top and tops of weird things. Um, and like nineteen like things that make no sense that he does every day because they're part of his routine now, so he does them every day. Like drinking coffee to go to bed makes like no logical sense. Watching the same episode of like Bones that he's never seen the end of to fall asleep, like I don't I don't understand how this person's married. Uh, so he's probably like the interesting person in terms of like the everything this dude says is like extremely weird, but said like in a very positive and personal way where you think like you're talking to like a friend of yours, but like what he's doing just like makes no logical sense. So he might be the most interesting dude, but at the same time, you know, I could say a lot of positive things about uh, a lot of guys I talked to where I found them very personal, like. I think Lucas Giglio is like very interesting. Um, you know, I, I've obviously talked to him a lot. Like, um, you know, Michael Kopech is not as like, is, he's been a bit more private this year. We haven't talked to him as much, but like, you know, getting to know how he grew up and his, like his, his family, like he's, he's a very compelling figure. And obviously what Tim Anderson has been through and what he's like kind of conquered and the adjustments he's made to his game are fascinating. So I, I'm very, I'm very hesitant to con- crown anybody as like interesting, but in terms of like, I hear something every day that just like what on earth like that yeah that's probably Liam <laughs> Hendricks whereas like Lance Lynn is just on brand all the time they had like family day yesterday after the game Sunday uh you know players had their like kids running around Lance Lynn is just literally um walking around watching his daughters run the braces with a, a red solo cup in his hand so one that's like absolutely the thing you would predict Lance Lynn to be doing <laughs> like yes it's sure. very funny but like it's it's just Lance he's pure Lance Lynn at all times I love that. It's a very likable team from my point of view, the way I cover them. So we appreciate your time. I'm going to hand you off before I let you go for a couple more questions to Chris Gonzalez. Cool. Yeah. Uh, James, once again, thank you for taking time out of your night to join us on your off night or your off day from the White Sox. We appreciate it. Um, first question, I'm, I'm kind of going to piggyback a little bit off of what Vinny was saying, but out of all the Sox personnel, who I know you talked about Lynn and Giolito that you mentioned there with Hendricks, but whom do you enjoy to interview? And it could be past or present. Give me whatever curveball you got in your arsenal for who you like to enjoy. I mean, like Danny Farquhar, like literally taught me about pitching in a way like that. I understand it now. Like until I talked to Danny Farquhar, I didn't really understand fastball carry in like a meaningful way uh, or like, I, I, you know, I had heard and read about tunneling, but like the way he like broke it down to me, uh, was just like simplified to a level that like really kind of helped my writing going forward for like, you know, in, until this day. So I, I, there are a lot of guys I like, there's a lot of like, you know, Ryan Burr is just like the chillest dude. Um, there's a lot of guys I've covered from a ball who are, you know, you know, Eloy is obviously very funny at all times. I think Luis Robert, being so quiet uh, and Yon Mankata to a similar degree that I think people probably underplay just like that dude like has like a lot of he's as motivated as any player on like the team like he's very much like holds himself to like just a very high standard uh, Robert which I, I, I find it fascinating like how focused and locked in he is but like obviously it's harder to know him given the language barrier but um, Farquhar is just I owe him a lot because he, he made me understand pitching uh, and just personalities uh, in the game to a great deal. Um, and, you know, he, he deserves a bit of credit for what Giolito eventually become. Uh, you know, obviously Ethan Katz is the one who remolded his delivery, but Farquhar is basically the Farquhar is basically telling Lucas Giolito to pitch how he pitches now back in 2017. Um, you know, before he went through like all the, the reinvention that he needed to do. So he's, he's a fascinating cat and, you know, speaks well to the White Sox that they recognize what he did and, you know, hired him in the organization. 
Could you give us a little bit of what he taught you um, from the funneling? Um, he just taught me about like how he measured, you know, fastball carry and when it went into it, and um, how kind of the rays uh, showed him and, and talked about in terms of, you know, the the measurement that Statcast does now is different in terms of like you know, fifteen inches of carry being good, but he basically. Because he used it, he was using a different scale that I think Brooks Baseball used it on, of ten inches of fastball carry being basically ten or above being elite, and uh, you know nine basically being the standard big league fastball, and eight inches of carry basically being a fastball that gets crushed just just about every time. And he kind of broke down the concept of you never want to be average, so you don't you never want to be eight, but you could throw a fastball that starts sinking and only has like seven or six inches of carry. And I think like Zach Britton throws a sinker at like negative one inches of carry. Um, the idea that you want your fastball to be moving uh, up or below what a hitter's eye will tell them they perceive all the time. So you either want it sinking more than the hitter realizes, or you want it kind of not sinking as much as the hitter realizes, so they'll swing over it and swing under it. At any given time, the, the idea that, that everything was based off of like messing with your eye level vertically on that concept, and then you'd have a curveball that you'd want to have following it and then drop because you want to kind of achieve that idea of it's coming at them like a normal average fastball and then falls off vertically. So, kind of explaining that concept to me was what really opened things up in a way where I could really understand uh, what they meant about why they would add a certain pitch to a certain arsenal and how uh, talking about, you know why you want um you know why we you why you, like lance lynn lance lynn throws his forcing fastball with carry up and why it works for him to basically throw two other fastballs with it because one is a cutter which snakes off to his um glove side which is um so it appears as his four seams for targeting to one side and the other one is a sinker and sinkers naturally fade to the arm side so he basically has the equivalent of a slider with his cutter and a changeup because of the way it, it fades, uh, his sinker fades in the same direction. So it's just the way he kind of broke it down made me think I can, you know, visualize why a guy's arsenal works or why it's deceptive to a hair uh, in a way that I really hadn't before I, I talked to him at length. And the fact that he was able to line it up with the, with data and talk about the way they were raised strategizing, which is like, Oh, maybe I kind of sort of understand pitching now at a level that, you know, pitchers are actually talk about and major leaguers are so used to talking to people who don't really understand baseball that they tend to oversimplify things just kind of like well the person i'm talking to doesn't can't follow along so giving me any sort of language that can kind of like show that i want to talk about it on the conceptual level they think about it just makes interviews a lot easier and better as opposed to just them saying like yeah i'm just trying to throw strikes because they assume you don't really you don't think about things on the level they do when couldn't follow if you if they tried to talk to you that way it intrigues me how you brought that up because i know uh vinny likes to watch the videos that bauer puts out there and on one of those videos he was talking about giolito and how he not on the fastball but on his change up he elevates it allows it to carry up in the zone and it's similar to what you're saying just changing the die level of the batter and how that's more effective lately and Bauer said that he, he wasn't sure if that was an organized organizational aspect that the Sox were doing with Giolito there or if it was something else, but it intrigues me how you were talking about that on the fastball with him. So maybe it is um, an organizational approach, uh, but Farquhar, he's been in places and that, you know, not, you know, all around baseball. So maybe it isn't organizational, but that'd be a good question maybe to talk to Giolito about, but I'm not sure if he'll give that up, but I mean, no one really throws their changeup quite like Giolito. Like, other people throw some high changes, but really not to the volume to which he does. And mm -hmm. I think it's because he's able to hide his arm action to such a degree that, like, he has a bit more deception than the average dude uh, in terms of people just recognizing it. So he's able to get up with, get away with it up a lot more. But, you know, kind of one of the elements of his first half uh, being a struggle is that he really got lit up on high changes a bit more than he had in the previous two years. I mean, especially saw that like in the, the Boston start and some of the other starts is that, you know, guys are a bit more prepped to his high changeup than they have been in the last couple of years. So 
a little bit of the magic of what he was able to do has been going away a little bit this season. So his second half is a little bit about uh, adjusting to that reality and, you know, pitching a bit more like a typical pitcher and not just floating these changeups over yeah. belt, you know, letter high over the heart of the plate and having people be like, what is this? Um, it, it, it seems like they figured out what that is. Although lately he's starting to dabble with that slider too. So, but yeah, yeah. No, I, I completely uh, love how you answered that question. Gave us a little bit about Farquhar. Um, now, what was your expectations of Tony entering the season and did they change? Um, I mean, I guess what everyone kind of thought in, in terms of something that changed, um, you know, I think, the initial like uh, fear was that he's going to clash like culturally with um, um, you know the clubhouse, and I think that's probably one of his smallest issues or problems uh, in the long run. Mostly because he has like buy-in from like Tim Anderson, and Jose Abreu, uh, so that's probably especially like when you know the whole your mean Mercedes thing was going on. Like you thought like oh he's going to lose them by being like strict on things, but really it's been kind of a non-fact of this last like, couple months and the degree and i've joked about this with friends the degree to which like that incident um continued to fortify like the players who push back on him uh, like tim anderson as like leaders of the team and like creating a unified con like clubhouse in terms of like uh you know really following those types of dudes Almost makes me wonder, like, was this, like, intentional? Was he playing, like, 4D chess to try to, like, unify around the player, player leadership tr- structure that he was already trying to build out in, in spring training? I don't think he was. I think he's just very strict and stubborn about this thing that he yelled at you're mean about. But um, the fact that that was an issue would probably be something that went against my expectations as far as, like, you know, being traditional – and like it was a strategy or being like strict about closer usage or not using the clothes on the road. I had like people going both ways. There are people who said like, Oh yeah, he's going to be old school and stuff like that. And there are people like, you know, Tony was one of the first like, you know, analytics infused managers of his time. He'll probably continue to innovate. So I really didn't know what to expect in terms of that. You know, it's, it's wound up, I feel like being uh, a bit more conservative. Um, but I also think like, I think he's been pretty, you know, they had a lot of injuries, so I can't say like they had like some medal that they've won from, from the way they did it, but like he's been very, you know, reliable or consistent about like, I'm going to, I'm going to use everybody at all times. Uh, I'm going to make sure my bench is fresh by playing them. I'm going to give guys a tons of day off, uh, which is something like Albert Pujols was saying when I asked him about it, like in spring training, it was like, Tony is very like attuned to like the rest schedule of, of players or he, he's very much trying to give days off and manage the usage of guys uh, in, in a way that's, like, very proactive. And I know on a game-to-game basis, like, you know, you see – you pull up a lineup, you see Larry Garcia batting in the heart of it, um, you think, like, what uh, – this is – you know, why, why are they doing this? Why, why is this happening? And uh, on an individual game basis, it can probably hurt them, but it's – he's someone who's been very strict about, like, trying to manage for the long run and not riding guys into the, the ground. Um, obviously – whether that pays off probably is dictated by whether they're successful or they're fresher than the other team in the playoffs. If they're not, or if in the playoffs, he's still batting Larry Garcia in the middle of the order and crucial situations, then obviously that wasn't like a big plus, but for now it's definitely something I paid attention to because it seems like he's been very adamant about it. Okay. And very similarly um, in your perspective, is it difficult to ask Tony uh, tough questions that nobody seems to want to ask him whether you do or don't have the IQ to, you know, to know the answers about um, kind of similarly to in Cincinnati with that base running situation, extra innings. Um, how do you view that, you know, that, those situations with him? Um, I want it to come, be purposeful. I don't want, like, I don't, I had another reporter like asking me the other day, like uh, if I like took it as like some badge of honor to like piss him off. It's like, no, like I want it to be like, have a reason. Like if it, I felt like something happened that like altered the result of the game. uh, You know, I think it, you know, the fans would want and deserve an answer about that subject. You know, when you see me like asking a tough question, you know, 
it's mostly because I think it's something that has to be answered. Like it's something where I don't think we should get out of this press conference uh, asking him. Otherwise, like we as a collective, as a beat, are not doing our jobs. So like, what was it? Friday, um, the game they won, you know, six four, and there's all the uh, hitting at Brayu. I'm like seventh oh, yeah. inning of that game. Gavin Sheets gets on, and I'm thinking like he's not going to get another at bat, uh, and he's DHing, and there was like a tie game at the time. Like, why didn't they pinch run for him? And he got to second base and he gets gunned out at the plate on like a in between or single trying to score from second. And I think like I, that doesn't make sense to me, especially because like the next half inning, Billy Hamilton is in a defensive like substitution. And at that point, I think like that's a really that seems like a miss. I'm like asking people around, I was like, is, is there any reason I'm missing why he wouldn't have pinch run? And I'm not getting anything. I think like, well, I, we got to ask this, you know, then. You know, they, they, they score the two runs they do in the eighth. Uh, you know, everybody's talking about the hit by pitches and, you know, the clear benches and the Brayu. Yeah, I'm curious about it. And, yeah, it's weird that they didn't pinch run. But, like, at that point, it's a very much a side issue. It's very much, like, not what the story of the game is. It's not, um, uh, you know, what everyone's talking about. And, you know, after the whole Abreu thing happened, like, he was irritated about that. It's just that would be like me where I pick my spot. And if I was like trying to get, you know, Tony pissed off every night, I would be like, why didn't you pinch run for Kevin sheets in the seventh inning? It made no sense. But like, and yeah, it's something I file away. And, you know, if it comes up again, or if he's not aggressive enough about pinch running, I'll, you know, challenge him about it. Or, you know, if he did, if he did that and it was game three of the playoffs, I definitely asked him about it. But like a random game in July, that they won anyway, like literally the next inning, you know, you kind of file those away. So it's really about like, where I think we absolutely need to get an answer, or I think this absolutely affected the game, or this like speaks well, this speaks to how he will strategize in the playoffs, or how this will going forward. You know, instances where like you know if Evan Marshall gets walked off in the ninth inning of a game on the road, the Yankees and Liam Hendricks is warm with the bullpen, and you're like, why didn't you use Liam Hendricks? Those type of questions where it's essential, where it's clearly had this like major impact on like a game that needs to be accounted for. That's where I think, like, yeah, we have to ask him. It's not about, like, yeah, it's, am I nervous he might, you know, get mad at me or am I worried about it? Yeah, a little bit. But you know, at this point, it's happened, like, six times where I, you know, you're a little bit of a, you're, there's a callus there. Um, but it, it's not where I don't like doing it. I don't like, you know, getting in shouting matches with people. But it's it, some situations where it's just, like, you, you got to do it. It's what everybody's talking about, you know, like, I'm on Twitter. I see what fans are yelling about. Like at a certain point, like you can't duck fundamental questions. So um, most of the time, it's not like a conscious thought of like, you know, I'm going to be on um, sports radio asking a question like, you know, the whole like day after where everyone was, um, um, you know, talking about my telling the rules. Like that's not what I wanted to do. I was, I was horrified by that. And if anything, I kind of reached out and made sure like, you know, I wasn't coming down there looking to embarrass anybody. I was just, you know, asking a question because I thought it was relevant to the game. But, and the feedback I got was everybody knew that. So it's just about necessity, I feel. And that's something I can respect, uh, the way you just answered it. And, uh, James, I, again, I appreciate your time and answering my questions. And thank you. Um, also, thank you for coming on our show. And I'm going to toss it back to Joe here. All right. Yeah, so James, we got a couple questions from the chat room, and then we'll let you go. A couple people interested to ask you. You were just talking about Tony, so I got to bring this up. Uh, FFB Goon wants to know: Could Tony Larusa beat anyone in a race? Uh, Besides Paul Canerco, I'm I'm happy. <laughs> oh, uh, could he beat anyone in a race? Um, I mean, he's got the hip replacement a couple of years ago, so like he's moving better without discomfort. So I don't know, never know. Probably, probably some member of the beat. Yeah, he was he was moving he was moving the other day. I was surprised how quick he was moving for Tony, but uh, that was fun. And then uh, we got one other here in the chat room from Ron Rupp. Now he wants to know what are your thoughts on Tim Anderson? It seems like his bat is a bit cold right now. Yeah, I mean, I was just looking this up because I was writing a piece about it. Uh, I think he's hitting, like, ever since his 16-game hit streak died, I think he's hitting, like, sub-200 over the last 7-11 games. He's not striking out at all. Uh, he's got six strikeouts and 48 plate appearances. It's like a 12% rate. That's really low. Uh, it's just, like, hits not falling. Uh, and it's weird because he's, like, the king of, like, batting the average on balls of play. 
So it's a weird cold streak. But like the last couple of games, I feel like, you know, he's lined out, you know, six or seven or eight times over the past like week. So I wouldn't say I'm worried about him in any kind of meaningful way. He doesn't, you know, he, at this point, he kind of knows who he is. He goes, he's super aggressive and he goes through some stretches where he takes himself out of his zone a little bit and gets a little too aggressive and then he falls back in. I think he's going to be a streaky player by the nature of just being very, you know, batting average oriented. He's not a walks and power guy. He's not like a, you know, super refined approach guy. He's somebody who kind of rides flows and rides streaks. So I, I think you're kind of de- going to deal with hot and cold with him, but kind of hope, you know, the hot streaks align with the playoffs again, like they did last year. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I feel like Timmy will turn it around sooner than later. They're going to fall eventually. Uh, and then we always ask our, our guests, if, if you could, uh, if you could do a station ID for us before you leave, uh, what I'll do is I'll put it up here on the screen for you. And then uh, you could add your own flair to it if you'd like. And then uh, I can count you in whenever you're ready. I'll give you a three, two, one, and then we can uh, give it a shot here. So are uh, you ready? I'll count you in. Sure. All right, here we go. We'll go three, two, one. I'm James Spiegan, the White Sox reporter for The Athletic, and you're listening to the South Burbs Hitmen. One take, James. Absolutely amazing. James, we appreciate all your time. And uh, before you leave, why don't you tell all our listeners and viewers, you know, where they can follow your work and, uh, you know, what kind of stories you have coming up soon. Uh, I am ironically writing for The Athletic tomorrow a story about Tim Anderson's uh, bad bip wizardry. Um, he has the highest batting average in balls in play over the last three years uh, by a large margin. Uh, only Yon Mankata, ironically, is within 30 points of him. So you can find that at The Athletic. In the entire league? Only Yon in, Mankata? In all of baseball. Here. Tim Anderson's 384. Mankata's 373. This is all since the start of 2019. Next guy, third place is Trey Turner at 354, 30 points below Anderson. Nobody yeah. has gotten batting average of balls of play like him in three years. It's very insane. That's right. That's right. That is that is an unreal statistic. We look forward to reading that article. Uh, for those of you who don't know, make sure you follow James on Twitter at JR Fegan and check out his work on The Athletic. James, again, thank you so much for all your time. We really appreciate it. Uh, you've given us an off day. Uh, enjoy the rest of your night, and uh, hopefully – yeah, you have a great deep postseason run to cover for us the rest of the year. Sure. I, I also look forward to being employed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. All right, man. Well, have a great night. Thanks again for joining us. All right. Take it easy. All right. Take care now. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, James. All right, guys. That was James Fegan from The Athletic, an absolutely dynamite guest. Gave, a, gave us so much of his time, and uh, it was just, you know, bringing knowledge from top to bottom. I mean, this guy knows the team – arguably better than anyone out there and uh, it really shows and it, it was so great that he gave us you know at least 40 45 minutes of his time uh, we really do appreciate that and gentlemen before we get on with the rest of the show we are going to take a quick commercial break and then we will be back uh, you know shortly after that so we will see you guys after the break i have the commercial ready to rock now uh, we'll see you guys in about uh, two two and a half minutes see you then south burbs hitmen will be right back So the Mikey Bet Show, do you know the Mikey Bet Show?
Hitman. And we are back after that commercial break from our barroom sponsors. And uh, gentlemen, a huge thanks again to James Fegan for joining us. Absolute dynamite interview. Uh, if you didn't catch that, make sure you go back, watch it on YouTube, Podbean, anywhere you can find podcasts. So uh, that's going to be uh, good stuff there. But guys, let's get into the rest of our show. And before we do, you know, I want to talk about some of these, you know, things from over the weekend. You know, we had we had Lambert and you know our boy Ronaldo Lopez coming in yesterday for the spot start. That originally I thought they might retool, you know, the rotation a little bit, getting those two extra day off, days off with the day off today. Uh, but it looks like, according to the White Sox website, that Dylan Cease will be getting the start and the bump tomorrow. So, uh, Vinny, I want to toss to you first. You know, what are your thoughts on on getting a little extra rest there? And uh, you know, do you th- is there anything more to it than just more rest? Yeah. So, I have two theories in mind. My first is that they kind of got roughed up a little bit last week at Kauffman Stadium, so they're going to try something new. It seems like um, Lucas Giolito and Dylan Cease, or no, Lucas Giolito and Dallas Keuchel, I believe, did not face them last week, or two of the three didn't. Regardless, no, it was a four game series. They all did. Anyway, I, I still think they wanted to like freshen up who they have going against Kansas City because of the fact that they struggled against them last week, even though it was on the road and they're significantly better at home. Number two, they're headed to a National League ballpark next weekend, which means that some pitchers are going to be taking some ABs. What two White Sox pitchers True. had the two best plate appearances or group of plate appearances so far this season? That would be one Lance Lynn, and that would be one Dylan Cease. I would assume – that it will be Lynn Rodon Cease against the Cubs on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So that's kind of one of my theories. I don't know if that plays anything into it whatsoever, but I don't know. I, I kind of like that those guys, Lance Lynn and Rodon, kind of get pushed back a little bit, lay with the All-Stars, let them rest, and go back to Dylan Cease tomorrow. I, I'm I'm okay with it. Yeah, I, I am too. And I think extra rest is is great for these guys especially at this point of the season where they could use it. And I'm with you, Vinny. I think these these pitchers are going to have to do quite a bit of hitting this weekend, uh, especially against the Cubs team that I have a feeling, you know, I'm not trying to jinx anything, but these guys could be going deep in these games. Uh, I'm with you. I think it's a great move. Uh, Gonzo, I got to get your thoughts quickly before we move on to the next subject. But uh, is it just rest? Do you think that he's going to switch up the rotation? Where do you land on it? Yeah, no, it's uh... I agree with uh, Vinny there. Um, my thoughts exactly, really. Uh, Rodon Lynn Cease. Cease is going to get two starts. Um, but yeah, just sets him perfectly going for not only the Cubs series, but then the following weekend where, th- you know, things really get heated up and with the contenders coming up on the schedule. Um, but yeah, this is just exciting week ahead. You know, another division foo. And then the Cubs sets us up. Perfectly, you know, with uh, Field of Dreams coming up here shortly. Yeah, that's going to be exciting. And like, as you and as you mentioned, Gonzo, and, and I think it's it's not to be you know looked down on. They have a tough schedule coming up. You know, they get the Yankees. Um, I'm, man, I know this off the top of my head. And of course, we get to play the Cubs, which you know they're not the tough team right now that they were a week ago. Uh, but they still got to go through that. They got to play division opponents. You know, this team is lining up for a tough stretch, and I think getting them the rest is exactly what we need. But, guys, we took two out of three from the Indians. Uh, we probably should have swept them that, that game on Saturday, which I was at. Oh, Vinny was there, too. You know, I went with my dad, and Vin, we, we ran into Vinny. Yeah, that place, first off, was absolutely hopping. That ballpark was to the brims full of people. Uh, and secondly, arguably the best baseball game that I've ever seen in my entire life. Back and forth, eight home runs. Um, there was one robbed catch in left field – who got robbed, Vinny, at, at the end of the game in the eighth inning? Was that Mancata? Somebody robbed. Mankata. Yeah, a ball right up against the fence. It would have scored two runs if it fell. And I can't remember the left fielder for Cleveland. I'm sure Vinny probably knows, but he made a crashing catch into the wall. And uh, if that ball falls, two runs score, and the Sox win that game. One of the craziest games I've ever seen. And I tell you what, the fans got their money's worth there. Um, but. It, it, it's a it's a series that we still took two out of three, and I, I'm happy with the outcome. And given the fact that we had offense in one game and all the other games that we got completely shut down, you know, I think we're going to see this offense come back to full health. Like like James mentioned, you have Aloy coming back, you got Robert coming back. Arguably this weekend against the Cubs, worst come to worst, I think this team 
you know, slowly comes out of it. But I could see them turning into like a, a fine oiled machine with getting the runs and the pitching on the same page. And that's what I want to see out of this team. And I think all of us are on the same page there. So personally, I, I can't wait to see what comes the rest of the week. That's weird having an off day today. I feel like they've been playing nonstop. And, uh, you know, it's kind of nice. There's no there's no game for us to keep up with. We can just talk about our team and, and not have to pay attention to another screen tonight. But uh, anyway, uh, let's get into the meat and bones of our show. We're going to get into our segmented portion. And uh, we're going to talk about a guy that we all know and love. And uh, he got a little bit fired up this week. I don't know if you guys remember it, but I'm sure everyone does. I'm just trying to tease it a little bit. But uh, our boy Tony La Russa, he got a little bit fired up, and we'll talk about it in this week's La Russa's Lock. Maybe. It runs. Before you play it, um, I just want to add real quick that what does kind of scare me is Sox's ability to not win on the road right now. They're under 500 on the road, and – when we get into the meat and potatoes of at the end of August here, you got to go on the road and play the Blue Jays and the Blue or the Rays and the Blue Jays, two hard teams tough, playing the AL East. Yeah, you got to win the road because we're gonna. <laughs> so October's coming quickly, and that's going to be a must. So, yeah, but so October ahead. is coming up quickly, and I'm going to try it again to play this video. If it doesn't work, I'm just going to pretend like it played. So. <laughs> So Gonzo, I- I'll let you talk about it a little bit as I pull up the video, but uh, why don't you set up a little bit for uh, the folks that didn't get a chance to see it uh, about when Tony got hit, or not Tony, when uh, Abreu got hit in the head yet again, and Tony uh, came to his boy's defense, because I-, I-, I love it, I know Vinny loves it, and I'm sure you love it. So talk us through that, and then I'm going to pull up the clip. Yeah, and it wasn't even just, you know, what happened over the weekend. I mean, this has been going on all season, Cleveland pitching him inside and plunking him. I mean, it has to stop, and I've it's just annoying to see, but it happened again, and Abreu took one inside, got hit, went down, and um, you know, everyone was clearing the benches, and Tony came rushing to his aid, and I don't know what exactly was said between Roberto Perez and Tony, but um, – Steve Stone had something to say about it, and um, that was kind of cleared up afterwards. And I know, Joe, you were talking about it on Twitter too. And um, it was something I uh, probably we probably should have asked James too to clear up as well. But um, interesting situation, and um, kind of what's similar to what Junior was saying last weekend is you know, Obrey is going to need the rest, and you just hate to see that our division foes that. They're in second place, but they're fading, and they keep trying to throw at our players, and you don't want our guys getting injured because of it. Yeah, you know, no doubt about it. It's uh, And then he gets hit again and again and again. It's getting old quick. So, Vinny, I got to come to you on this one. You know, Tony mentioned, you know, that, you know, the catcher shouldn't be calling pitches high and inside, you know, because the command was really struggling. I think uh, – who was on the – Karinchek? Uh, Karinchek. Karen Check, Karen Check yeah. was on the mound and, and he walked three guys straight or two guys straight with something like that. Uh, he was all over the plate. Uh, tell me a little bit about that and uh, your thoughts on it. Yeah. So my thoughts, are, I see both sides. If I was a Cleveland Indians fan, I'd be like, what the hell is Tony La Russa doing? He's clearly not throwing at him. You saw it based on his reaction. Normally, if you're purposely throwing at a guy, you don't almost throw up on the mound and you don't hobble over and act and he left the game. No issue. And if you're Tony La Russa, you have to go out there and make a scene because your star leader, former MVP, arguably best player is rolling around on the ground because he just got hit for the second time of the game on the first pitch. And they ended up getting hit again later in the series. Do I think the Indians are throwing high and inside on purpose to push him off the plate and not allow him to hit baseballs to Pluto? Absolutely. Yep. Do I think Karen Check is purposely trying to – Throw at Abreu? No. Do I wish Karen Check was still able to use his spider tack or some uniform thing so he could not have just terrible command like that? 
and make it dangerous? No. But I, I understand what Tony's doing. I, I would love to know what was said between him and the catcher because all the catcher was doing was like consulting Abreu, like, hey, are you okay, man? I'm sure it had something to do with, like he said, the calling balls high and inside. But, I mean, Karen Check just lost control on the pitch that hit Abreu in the head. There's no way around it. But, you know, I see both sides. I'm happy to see Tony doing stuff like this after Me too, what Me too with man. Yermin earlier in the season. It kind of looked like he rolled over your mean with a bus earlier in the season, and then it all came out. It kind of realized that your mean might have more going on than just what was happening with the 3-0 pitch. So – I don't know. I, I'm a fan of the way Tony handled it, and I understand why people on Cleveland would be like, dude, it was an accident. And don't forget this yeah. is the same dude and Roberto Perez. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the same dude that took that <laughs> took that pitch Rodon inside pitch. from Rodon, that no-hitter, to ruin the perfect game. Yeah, yeah, he was. Uh, oh, man, I, I'm not going to let that go. I can't stand that I dude. know you won't. I know. It's a tough one. But we do have a good question in the chat. Uh Robert Mandel wants to know, did the ump ever issue a warning to the Indians? I don't believe he did, right, Vinny? If I remember correctly, both benches got warnings when they threw out a Brayu or hit a Brayu in game three on Sunday. Right. I believe both benches got a warning, but I'm not sure each team got a warning. Karen Check came out of the game after that. So I don't know if each bench got a warning. It's hard to tell when benches clear what umpires actually call. But – I know that in the th- game three on Sunday, both teams got a warning. The one, the guy who hit Abreu on Sunday is one of those real a holes. I'm trying, I'm blanking on his name now. Either way, I know exactly who you're talking about too. They can't, um, they can't punish any of Cleveland players because to me it was just so on accident. You're not, you're not beating Abreu to give the lead run with bases loaded in a high leverage game like that. I know Cleveland's dead and they're out of it. And, you know, they kind of raised the white flag by giving the team ahead of them their second baseman that has 18 home runs. But yeah. it, it's those players still want to win, regardless of what the organization thinks. So I see both sides. For sure. And, guys, I, I want to highlight another thing from Tony that I, I was really impressed with is, is the use yesterday of, uh, of course, the, the use of, you know, you had starting the game – Man, I'm just trying to blink here. Uh, <laughs> you had uh, Lambert start the game, and then you had Lopez continue the game. And I, I was really impressed with how he used those guys and was able to get a win out of it. I mean, those guys didn't just pitch well. They they arguably dominated. Reynaldo Lopez especially has been pitching really well as of late. So I got to give props to Tony for how he's handling that. Uh, Gonzo, you know, what are you seeing out of these guys pitching-wise? And w- – you know, Reynaldo Lopez looks like a totally different guy. Is he all of a sudden back to life? Did Ethan Katz work some magic into him? Uh, what's going on? Yeah, because earlier in the season, both these guys, you know, were struggling. Um, I, I, I really wish we would have saw this a week earlier before the deadline, so maybe we might not have had to get rid of Madrigal. <laughs> but, you know, um, interesting that Lopez is stepping up when we need him. Same with Lambert. Um, I didn't get to see too much of their performances yesterday, um, but I'm glad to look back at it and see the progression that they're making. Um, hopefully, it continues on forward. Because if you know, if we're going to be resting guys, we're going to need these guys at the bottom half of that rotation or in our pitching staff to you know pick up the slack and uh, get key outs and uh, down the stretch. Um, to extend our division lead and um, just eat innings up, really. Um, especially if Kopech is going to stay in the bullpen, um, right. it's going to be le- less innings uh, that he would get as a uh, you know starting on the mound. Um, but yeah, it just all together. I- I'm glad that those two did step up because uh, when you're just teeter tottering with you know Charlotte, you're going to need someone to step up and. Um, they're doing it at the right time when and that's down really the stretch are. here. It is. It's down the stretch. And those guys, uh, they, they gave this, these starters an extra day, which is huge. And I know Vinny would agree with that, but, but Vinny, I got to ask you before we move on, you know, <laughs> this team, they win games that they shouldn't win. 
And oftentimes they lose games that they shouldn't lose. But yet here they are leading their division by nine games, uh, over 60 wins. You know, how, how do they keep winning when they have, it's always the opposite of what you think is going to happen. I feel like it's a roller coaster ride, but it really hasn't been that big of a roller coaster ride. I think our expectations are just that high. I just, I, I got to get your thoughts on that. I know it's a super loaded question, but what do you got? Yeah. So I'll explain it the way it popped in my head as soon as you asked it. People only like to think about the negative things a lot of the times when it comes to the White Sox without realizing that they have an 8.5 game lead in the division. They're the only team in the division that is above, I think Cleveland won today, so they're technically a game over 500. They're the only team in the division with a positive run differential. Everyone likes to focus on how they're under 500 on the road, even though I'm pretty sure it's only by one game and they got swept by Houston, so that plays a big factor in it. And they got swept by New York at Yankee Stadium, so that plays a big factor in it. Um, the, the team's going to be very different next time those two teams meet. In a, like Instead of bringing up that they're a game under 500 on the road, let's talk about how they have the best home record in Major League Baseball, which is the stadium they're yep. going to play at the most the rest of the season. Yeah, they're going to have to win some big games on the road. There's no doubt about it. But is a series against Houston in Ju- July, was it June or July regardless, that they didn't have Aloy, that they didn't have Robert, you know, Cesar Hernandez came in and replaced Madrigal now. They have Kimbrell. The, the rotation is amazing. There's so many good things with this White Sox team that I'm not even slightly worried. Do I think they're going to win the World Series? Maybe. But if they got beat by Houston or Tampa in the ALCS, like I wouldn't be surprised. But I also wouldn't be surprised if they beat them. It's baseball. That's like how it goes. And the White Sox are, without question, one of the best teams in the American League. They prove it night in and night out. Most of the time, they smash the teams they're supposed to beat, and they hover at or are slightly above 500 against the good teams. I was looking at that. I mean, we'll talk about that dumb graphic that came out earlier today. And, yes. like, all the teams on there, the only ones that they struggled against this season were Houston and New York. And New York, before getting Rizzo, fell off a cliff after getting – or after sweeping the White Sox, literally that from the moment they swept the White Sox to now, other than the Rizzo stuff, they've fallen off a cliff. They took two or three the most recent time they played Houston, and they're still not 100% healthy yet. Luis Robert, yeah. if he hits the ground running, could be a game-changing elite five-tool player that plays a premier position at a high level. And Eloy Jimenez is a generational hitter. I mean that from the bottom of my heart that I think he is one of the best hitters, young hitters that the team has ever had. I can see him challenging Paul Konerko for second place on the all-time White Sox home runs list. Frank Thomas might be a little tough, but we'll we'll even see on that. This dude is unbelievable. You, he played three games. He won one of them by himself. Uh, the pitching yeah. had a lot to do with it too, but you get like in terms of offense, he won it by himself. And Yasmani Grandal, whether he comes back and catches or DHs or plays first base, he has an insane power bet. He has a high slugging percentage for a reason. He has a high on base percentage. This team just has so much going for it, and I try really hard to focus mostly on those things. The fact that you had a guy, a Hall of Famer, like Dirty Craig Kimbrell to the mix, for a second baseman who you have basically replaced and a hard-throwing right-handed pitcher that might turn into a really good closer for the Cubs one day, and, you know, everyone knows how much I don't like the Cubs and root against them and hope they lose 100 games every single season. I truly think <laughs> that they have a chance to develop Hoyer into a really good pitcher. So, but, you know, you pay premium prices to get premium return. And I, I'm all in on the, the positive with this team because it's the best White Sox team of my lifetime. And I'm including the 2005 White Sox team because that team had a little bit of magic dust. They did. They they had that uh... – they didn't stop believing. Isn't that right, Vinny? Yeah, they didn't stop believing. This team, it, it almost – like they're so talented. Who from the 2005 team is in the Hall of Fame? Frank Thomas, who didn't play. Like, That's And it. this White Sox team has plenty of players who could be on a Hall of Fame trajectory. If Eloy Jimenez made it one day, I'd be 0% surprised. If Moncada made it one day, I'd be 0% surprised. Robert, I would almost say he's already on that track. We'll see if they can all stay healthy. They're very young, so it's hard to like you know talk about that kind of stuff. But the point is, they're super talented, MVP level players, and it's they're all on the same team, and it's so fun to watch. I I love every second of it. I despise that they're not playing right now. 
<laughs> I too, still man. would make a case for Burley and Canerco for the Hall of Fame. Uh, Maybe I eventually. That's a conversation for another day. If Roland's getting the votes he is, I, I'd still take Pauly over Roland. And you're not going to see a, another guy like Burley eating up 200 innings a year. Like The only one you're seeing right now doing it is Lance Lynn. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, the, there's there's no one on this team uh, from a pitching perspective that, that has been a dud all year long. They've been great. But uh, speaking of duds – yeah. I do want to mostly agree with what Vinny said, but I'm still concerned about the road winning right now on the road. It's, it's going to make or break us this year. Um, do I think they can do it? Yes. I'm hoping they will too, but it's still a little concerning. And, you know, we had to hope that the health remains even when we get these guys back. Cause we just had Eli come back and then tweak his groin. You hate for this to see Robert do that as well. Um, not even, to say, you know, and our pitching rotation has been healthy to this point as well. You know, not going to avoid that guy right here that, that remains the same. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm extremely positive. Uh, I'm sticking to the positive on being over 500. What was it, 18? Well, how many games over, Vinny, did you say? Uh, I want to say it's 18 or 19 over 500. 18, I, understand, yes. I understand the road concerns. Like, I truly do. Like, you got to win games on the road. I just am not – I think of how they got that bad road record and I, you know, try to build on it because of the fact that they did get swept by Houston in Houston. It was a four, four game series about a month ago, the Yankee series where they, they Andrew Vaughn tied it off of a roll this Chapman in the ninth inning. And then the stupid ninth inning rule, uh, Garrett Cole shoved the ball up their face in his last ever start with spider tack. I mean, there are just so many things that like led to that, that make me think like, Oh, things can change. And I get what you're saying on that point, but I, we can't also forget, I think the one that's more important is the trip to Milwaukee. And we, yeah, were, were, struggling. They- we, were, we were struggling there too. So that hurts me a little bit more because that's a team I can see us facing <laughs> come you know, yeah, yeah. later on. This guy, but they did face the three guys. They got like the worst luck of all time in that series yeah. with who they faced. But that's who they're going to face in the but World Series. Yeah. yeah. You know, exactly. hopefully that – the rest of the road games don't turn into a bunch of duds like the ones we're about to talk about in this week's Adam Dud of the Week. You suck. You suck. Suck. Stupid Joe. Lousy. No excuse. What a dud. What a total, total dud. Yeah, that's right. And uh, Vinny, that was a great segue, man. I, I really, really, really liked that one. So, uh, Keep, keep those coming, man. Keep them in your back pocket. Uh, save it for a rainy day. I love it. Uh, but, uh, of course, you know, we're going to talk about the duds of the week. And you guys can hear me, right? I'm not crazy. Yeah. Yeah, no, I got All right, you. cool. I thought maybe you lost me for a second, but I'm back. It's all good. Technologically, we are great. So, anyway, uh, there's a couple guys that kind of pooped the bed this week. <laughs> you can kind of you can kind of uh, spin, spin the twister wheel and see what happens and you can land on a bunch of them but uh you know I, I hate to say this out loud the guy the guy is taking a beating all year long but my adam dud nominee of the week has got to be jose abreu and I, and I know he's still getting on base i know he's still scoring runs uh but he went one for 15 this week 0.067 batting average you know he did walk four times he went he had three rbi and especially considering he only had one hit i know he got doinked with the bases loaded and he scored one run, but, um, you know, just rough sledding for Jose right now. I know he's going to turn it back on historically speaking his, they were showing during the game yesterday that he has, his OPS is always highest during August. So we've hit it to August. The weather is going to continue to stay warm. And hopefully that means Jose is going to get warm. Uh, but this week he was not. So Jose is my Adam dud of the week, as much as it hurts me to say it. So uh, sorry, Jose, but uh, you got to turn it around this week, man. I feel like you will. You're, you're a warrior. You're going to do it. Uh, Gonzo, wh- who you got this week for your Adam Dud? I was very validated um, this week. I'm going to go with Michael Kopech, um, who, <laughs> gosh, it, it just was tough to see him fall apart in that game, giving him five earned runs. Um, 
just to think that if he gave up one less, it's a tie ball game, two less, and it's a W. Um, but because we saw that, I think that very first game of, uh, you know, we saw Kopech, um, Kimbrell, and Hendricks, and we, we were all hyped up about it. And then the next time we were going to see that, it just fell apart. Um, granted, you know, pitchers, they, it happens, you know, Pitchers have bad outings, so I'm sure this is just a bad outing for Kopech, and he's going to bounce back and just completely continue his, you know, role that he's been on. Um, I'm not um, worried about him at all. Um, he just might add him dud for this week for that performance yeah. alone. Um, but that's not saying much. Tip- as long as he stops tipping his pitches, because <laughs> I think that's the main thing, and hopefully he can get that corrected. Um, I know that's not something he's done all year. So that, that aspect's a little concerning to me. Um, but, you know, he's got time to correct it. And I'm sure Katz and, and Zavala and, you know, if if we ever see uh, – uh, why am I drawing a blank here? Uh, what, the, what is the other catcher's name? I, I know what it is. Oh, Zach Collins. Thank you, Zach Collins. <laughs> Forgive me. But if we ever see Zach Collins again, maybe he'll work with Kopech as well. But uh, – yeah, it's concerning to me that he's tipping pitches, so hopefully he gets that corrected. But, uh, yeah, uh, rough week. Yeah, Vinny and I were actually texting each other from across the park. I'm in 155. Vinny, you were what, 106? 107. 117. What, 117. So we're on opposite sides of the park. He's like, is Kopech warming up? I said, no, not yet. And then I see the phone ring, and it picks it up, and I was like, oh, he, the, the call just came in. And sure enough, Kopech comes in. And he's warming up. Vinny, I totally forgot to mention this to you, but when he started warming up, he was he wasn't full distance in like at the full length for the bullpen. He was in the halfway point, just kind of tossing like a quick catch with the bullpen catcher. And then after about five minutes, he went to the full distance. I haven't seen anybody do that all year in the pen. It was kind of interesting. Not sure if that's got anything to do with it or not. Probably not, but uh, he just wasn't himself. Uh, you and I were both thinking he was going to shut it down. If he did, they would have won that game. But uh, you know, wh- real quick before we move on, what did you get out of Kopech? And then we'll get you, we'll get your dud after that. But you know, what did you see? And uh, you know, ultimately, why does that loss fall on him? Yeah. So with the halfway the bullpen thing, I wonder if that's just part of like the regimen that they're doing because of his innings and everything that's gone on with him, and just a way to warm Maybe. him up. You know, maybe he was having just an off day. The fact that the one game this season that Michael Kopech struggled and laid an egg Stunk. was something that is correctable. Tipping pitches is very correctable. Just figure out a way not to do that. And Cleveland faced him. You know, they're a division rival. The teams that you play in the playoffs are not going to know Michael Kopech as well as Cleveland and Minnesota and all them. But – they're going to do their homework on him like nobody's business. I'm not saying that's not an issue, but sure. he's the most talented pitcher in the organization, in my opinion. And the fact that he was the reason that they lost on Saturday was a little interesting to me, but I don't expect it to continue. And getting back to under two ERA, 100 mile an hour Kopech is exactly what I expect him to do. I'm not going to let totally. one bad ending take away from the last three innings he had before that, where he faced 12 batters and struck out nine of them and got the other ones out. I think he gave up one hit to, I, I want to say it was, I can't even remember who they were playing at that point. The Brewers. And yes, it was the Brewers. Know, and it's just one of those things, like every pitcher is going to have their that game where they're not on it. And, you know, he was going to be someone I named for my Adam Dodd of the week. And hearing that from me, should speak volumes because he's my favorite player in the organization. Not even close. Um, I was going to also pick a Brayu, but, you know, Jose's our guy. He's playing his favorite team to play against this weekend. He hit six home yeah. runs in three games last season against the Cubs. I'm sure he's very excited to go play them, as excited as I am to watch him play them. But I'm going to actually go off the board here and take somebody who better turn it around because if you're a former Cub that's going to come to my team and stink, I'm going to hate you. <laughs> And I'm talking about you, Ryan Tapera. I know you're watching. I'm rooting for you. If you're good, the White Sox could have the best bullpen they've ever had. And even if you're not, they still could. But they gave up Bailey Horn to get him, who's a very hard-throwing pitcher. And the Cubs are going to try and get, 
you know, shout out to my friendly confines guys. If they're watching, I'm going to say something. Absolutely. Nasty. If you get 20 ish hard throwing bullpen arms and you hit on two of them, you won. You did well. So good on you for getting Bailey Horn. We'll see what he turns into for you. And Ryan Tapera just better get some one, two, three innings for me down the stretch. And I'll love him forever. He was very good for the Cubs. He's only given up three runs in the month of July, and they all came in a White Sox uniform, which is very annoying. And like I said, <laughs> I, I love when former Cubs come to the White Sox and are awesome. So I can say, ha, ha, ha. But that hasn't happened so far with Tapera, so he's my Adam Dutt of the week. We'll see what he can do this upcoming weekend. And we love it, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We get big, big, big time. This team – this team's got to pick up some wins here when they can because they do have a tough schedule coming up. So, yeah, definitely got to f- focus on that. But those are our duds. But let's get to the opposite side. Um, White Sox Charities at the ballpark is selling Golden Hawk bobbleheads. $35 all goes to White Sox Charities. He just went into the Hall of Fame. And uh, let's get to a segment that he lends his voice to. Let's put it on the board. Ball hit deep. Yeah, so we're going to talk about some players that just lit it up this week, went absolutely hog wild crazy, and there's a handful of guys that had had good weeks here, guys. Um, I'll I'll go last. I'll, I'll let you guys talk to it. So uh, we we let Vinny go last last time. So I'll go ahead and let Vinny lead the way here. But uh, Vinny, who is your put it on the board player of the week? Okay, going first, I could state the obvious one who absolutely went off in the game that we did, but I'm not, I'll say, I'll let you guys take him. I'm going to go with someone who I've been backing pretty much all season long. Cause I truly believe in this guy struggled early. And I truly, from the bottom of my heart, believe it was bad luck because he is a sinker, sinker ball pitcher. And every now and then those guys, they get it beat into the ground and Moncada has to try and bare hand to play. And you know, he muffs it and uh, bummer. I'm talking about Aaron bummer. And it's a bummer when those things happen. But it is not a bummer when he throws his gas right over the plate and guys have absolutely no chance. And his breaking stuff is as good as any reliever on the White Sox. The MLB Shredder named him a top 10 reliever for a reason during the offseason. And when his stuff is on, he is on. And this week he went three innings, four Ks, no earned runs. That's the Aaron Bummer we know and love. That's the Aaron Bummer that can be a setup man to either Dirty Craig or Liam Hendricks. And I'm all in on this guy. I believe he kind of reminds me of if Chris Sale was a reliever. Like he's just like a super thin dude. He always looks kind of mad. And he does I look like mad. I look I like that about him because I always look like I'm mad, even though I'm not. And so I can relate. I just truly think that this guy, his stuff is like is it's, it's as good as any reliever on the team. And when he's going, he, if you got Kimbrell and Liam going in the same game you can use a guy like bummer in the seventh inning that's borderline unfair if you go starter for five Kopech, bummer kimbrell hendricks that's borderline unfair if a playoff game ever works out that way and he's yeah. the one who said before the season started we should go 90 and 0 in games we enter the seventh inning with a lead and they haven't but it's not as bad as people make it out to seem. If you were to talk to an average White Sox fan, hey, how's Bummer doing? What do you what's your guess on his ERA is? They'd probably guess in like the sixes. It's still under four. It's not great, but it could be great if he keeps this up. That's my um put it on the board player of the week. He's been awesome and their bullpen relies heavily on him. Yeah, there's 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 no doubt about that. I think we're all happy to see him turn things around. And he just had a he had a great week, and that's what we want to see moving forward. But uh, Gonzo, how about you? Who who are you putting on the board this week, my friend? Yeah, I'm going to take the obvious because I'm not going to overthink it. Um, it's going to be Sebi Zav- Zavilia. I probably butchered that name. Um, Savala. Savala. There we go. Sebi Savala. I learned over the weekend that his actual name is Sebastian, and that's where Sebi comes from. <laughs> Thank you, Jason Benetti. I'm learning something new every every podcast. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, this guy, you know, we haven't seen too much of in the past when he came up, at least on the offensive, you know, side of it. He's always considered a defensive catcher. And um, Joe, you were there, right, for his game? Yeah, yeah. Vinny and I were both there, and my dad. And one of those shots, I was probably like very similar to that grand doll shot that we saw together. Um, this, this grand slam right here was an absolute moon shot. All three home runs went to a different field. That's absolutely yeah, That's beautiful. the second grand. That's the grand slam. And then up coming up next is, is the third one. And he talk about having a day, man. Uh, the bullpen did not have a day, but Stevie Zavala certainly did. Uh, probably the yeah. day of his career for sure. And uh, maybe yeah. maybe Sebi could actually uh, can hit, clearly. And here's the third one. Boom, shakalaka, going all the way out to right field, just into the Goose Island. So, so Gonzo, talk a little bit about what you saw out of him and, and how excited you are that he's finally starting to wake up his bat. Well, considering on the drought that Collins has been on, um, I did not expect this to come from Sabala. Um, I, I mean, in a game that was a blowout over a bullpen, he made it actually pretty close. And uh, that's the spark that our guys are going to need, you know. That whole next man up mentality that this team has and has had all season, it just continues. And if you can keep this up, I mean – I know Junior was talking about us needing another catcher, but we could have found one <laughs> in our own little, you know, system here. Um, yeah, and but I mean, to be fair, all of Zavala's hits for the week came in this game. He went four for twelve. He had three thirty-three. You know, the three homers, mm-hmm. six RBI, and a walk, and four runs scored. Uh, it was it was definitely something to see. <laughs> but uh, Vinny, I know you got a little tidbit here for us. Why don't Why don't you drop a little bit of the knowledge bomb on us? Oh. Yeah, so his OPS doubled in that game, which is really funny. It was in the twos, and it ended up in the fours thanks to the three home runs and singles that he – or I said OPS, I meant slugging percentage. Um, he's also the first player in Major League Baseball history to have his first, second, and third career home run come in the same game. So that's absolutely magnificent. And I actually have one more that's in my brain. I didn't write it down. He joins do Harold. He joined Harold Baines and Paul Konerko as the only three White Sox players to have three home runs in the same game with one of them being a grand slam. Wow. That's truly impressive. One of those guys is not like the other two. <laughs> that's that's a fair assumption. <laughs> the other two um, have their numbers retired at guaranteed right field. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's crazy. But uh, Zavala definitely had – a heck of a game and hopefully he can keep it up. Uh, yeah, I know we've all gone offense and I'm, I'm going to go offense too with my pick, but I do want to give an honor. Well, no, actually you went, you went bummer. I'm going to go honorable mention before I go with my, my other pick here, but uh, I do want to go with Ronaldo Lopez. He, you know, went six innings pitched zero earned runs, a W and eight K's this week. So, uh, you know, he had, he had a good week. So uh, hopefully he continues to dominate, but uh, the guy I got to talk about here is, you know, Brian B. Goodwin. I mean, uh, with the walk off mm-hmm. last night, you know, he sends this one with the bat flip. Let's see if they show the replay there. Uh, bringing the ultimate swag to end the game. There it is. Pitchers pissed off. The crowd's going nuts. I mean, Brian Goodwin brings the swag. And uh, let's watch this bat flip and see if they show it here. I want to see one more time. There it is. Wait, up, 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 up. There it is. The ultimate swag, um, it just, you know, something like that's got to get you fired up, and especially when he sends this ball to the moon to end the game. Uh, he's got a lot of hate this week. He played some bad defense, but uh, he made up for it here, uh, to, to say the least. And those boys are fired up, you know, heading into Kansas City tomorrow. Uh, it's it's, it's going to – or no, not heading in. They're playing Kansas City at home, uh, going to play Kansas City tomorrow. And uh, I tell you what, I'm I'm more than excited for it. Uh, it's been a hell of a week. These boys are getting it done, even when they're not playing on all cylinders. So uh, for me, that's the coolest thing about this is, you know, they haven't even fully reached full full health, full you know, all pedal to the metal yet, and they're still as good as they are. I think they're going to get better, Vinny, and I'm excited to see that happen. 
Um, I know everyone's all pumped up about that, but I got to get to the pick to click section now of the show. We all had a rough week last week for the most part. Uh, I took Tim Anderson, who, as we mentioned, had a rough week. Uh, Four for 22. He bet 182 with only one RBI and two strikeouts this week. Uh, Not a typical Timmy week. Uh, But as James mentioned earlier, uh, he's had some really bad luck. That's going to have to turn around at some point. Uh, Vinny, you went with Aloy Jimenez, who who was good while he was active. He went two for seven with three RBI and a home run. But, of course, he tweaked that groin. We haven't seen him since. Uh, Hopefully he comes back for the Cubs series. Uh, I almost gave it to you, Vinny, this week, and uh, I was really close. But Gonzo had Dylan Cease, who went six innings, uh, only two earned runs, uh, three ERA, six strikeouts, and a walk. And last but not least, Zim took Jose Abreu, who had a horrendous week, one for 15, 0.067 with four walks, three RBI, and a run scored. So uh, it was between you, Vinny, and Gonzo. And with the seven at-bats, I had a hard time giving it to you for Eloy. So I went ahead and I gave it to Gonzo. So, Gonzo, this puts you at the 10-win mark for the standings. You're sitting with 10 wins. I have five. Zim has four. And Vinny's got one. But to be fair, Vinny has only had seven opportunities. This is Vinny's seventh show, I believe. And uh, I... All of us, Sim, Gonzo, and, and myself have been on for every show, which, Gonzo, what is this, 21? The 21st show or something like that? Uh, 20. 20. It's the 20th show. I guess I could have just added those all up. That would have probably been the easy way to do it. But, you know, who, who does math? Forget that. But uh, nonetheless, Vinny's going to catch up eventually. And we're going to we're gonna get to the picks for this week now. Uh, of course, we'll let the winner go first. Gonzo got last pick last week, and he still managed to pull it off. Uh, because of his internet connection issues. But, you know, he gets to go first this week, and hopefully it backfires. Gonzo, who are you taking as you pick the click for the week? You, It wasn't internet connections. You just put me last last week because you had Ozzy go. But it's maybe, okay, Joe. Maybe it was. I'm going to give I'm gonna give Chuck a run for his money because I'm picking, what, 500 or 10 out of 20. Um. Half half yeah, you picks some winning. Half, that's kind of crazy to think about. But I'm giving Chuck a run for his money. I think he's a, at what four hundred something percentage. But he chooses a lot more games than I do. Them. So that's that right. is what it is. But I'm gonna go I, as much as I would love to go on the train again with another possible uh, double start for Cease this week. I'm gonna. Go away from that just because I'm not sure what Tony's going to do at the end of the on Sunday of this upcoming week. Who knows? But uh, I'm going to go with the guy struggling right now, the MVP. I'm going to go Mr. Pito himself, Jose Abreu. Uh, I think he's going to get heated up this week versus Kansas City and the Cubs. Um, I just think he's going to get on fire and at a time when we're going to need him because, like I said, we're going to go uh, after the – or we got Minnesota, Yankees, and then it goes to, I think, the A's. And then after the A's, just a stretch with um, the Rays and Tam- and the Blue Jays. And we're going to need our uh, our guys to start hitting and pick up this offense. Um, we know the pitching staff is going to be there. But ultimately, if you want to beat these teams and really close that magic number down from 50 down to, you know, the 20s and the teens, this offense has to pick it up. Um, I believe they're going to, you know, I'm sure they're going to do well at home. I'm just hoping that they can show us on the road, give us a little spark of what we get to see um, within the next couple months here and where we can really uh, take out that negativity and really focus on the positive and uh, what this team, what this team is capable of, which we all know on paper, Bert, on paper, Bert, on paper, what it is um, capable of, but not oh. only, not only on paper, but what Rick Hahn went out of his way to make sure he did everything he could do as GM to put us where we need to be. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, I love the pick, you know, he's a cup killer. So let's see what Jose does. Uh, our buddy Steven Zim Zimmerman could not join us tonight. He's dealing, he's feeling a little under the weather, but uh, he'll be back probably with us next week, but he did send me his pick to click. Uh, he's going to go with Gavin sheets this week. Uh, going into uh, the series with the Royals and the Cubs. We'll see how that works for him. He might see some work at first base like he did the other day. We'll see. 
maybe Jose DHs in Kansas City. We'll see. Uh, obviously, we we'll see the pitchers batting in and Wrigley, but we'll we'll see what happens in that respect. But uh, with that, you know, Vinny, I'll go ahead and toss it to you next. Who who are you picking for your pick to click? Okay, I almost never go back to back. I don't like doing it. It's just not something I like. But I got gypped last week. I yes, you did. Gypped. I think Eloy might have won for me. He got more of a win for the White Sox than Dylan Cease. Sorry, Gonzo. You won fair and square. Um, I did not know on July 23rd, 2017, while it was happening, that it was going to turn out to be one of the single best days of my life. I have family and friends and all those things mean a lot to me, but few things are as important to me as the White Sox being better than the Cubs and Eloy Jimenez and Dylan Cease for Jose Quintana will live in infamy for the North side forever. And it will live in greatness for the White Sox forever. And he's going to go back and play his former team. I am expecting at least two home runs against the Cubs from him. And hopefully he gets a nice little warm up against the Royals. Like Fegan said, he was running the bases tomorrow. I do know he did take batting practice over the weekend and was playing some left field shag and fly balls. I think they're just sure. being extra cautious with him based on everything that's happened so far this season. And there was really no reason for him to like play through any kind of tightness. Like if it were the playoffs, I think he probably would have been playing. So I'm going to go with Aloy Jimenez. He loves playing his old team. He's always happy. Very few people in the world have more energy than me. Eloy Jimenez is one of them, and I would like him to win me my second pick to click. Let's do it, man. I like the pick. Thanks, Cubs. Hopefully we'll be saying that all weekend long. Thanks, Cubs. Oh, and they gave him his silver slugger at the game we were at. That was really cool. They did. Yeah, that was awesome because I know when the other guys got it earlier in the year, he wasn't around. But, uh, yeah, he got the silver slugger, and let's hope he silver slugs his way the rest of the season. I'm going to change it up a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go with a new acquisition as my pick to click for the week. Uh, Do I'm going it. Go with Cesar Hern- I'm going to take Cesar Hernandez going into the play the Royals and to play the Cubs. Uh, I'm the guy's green. been pretty – thank you. He's been pretty clutch since we picked him up. He's, he's dinking and doinking, and he's playing great the defense. He made a great over-the-shoulder catch in the outfield the other day. Uh, you know, I just love what I've seen out of him so far. Uh, he's really a grinder. He's like he he just fits the White Sox player mold. Uh, I I think Cesar is going to have a huge week here. I think he's the difference maker in both of these series, and uh, I can't wait to see what he does. So I'm going to go with Cesar Hernandez. I, I'm feeling good about it. So recap here real quick, and then we'll let Vinny give his blurb. Jose Abreu is going to Gonzo. Vinny is going with Aloy Jimenez. Zim is going with Gavin Sheets. And I am going with Cesar Hernandez. Hi, Mom. And uh, Vinny, what are your thoughts? Cesar Hernandez hasn't hit a home run with the White Sox yet. His last game with Cleveland Guardians, he did hit a home run. So he's due. So I like the pick on your part. Just wanted to throw that in there. And I like the shallow uh, outfield and the baskets at Wrigley. So that's another thing. You're going to see some dingers this weekend at Wrigley. Oh, yeah. From – I don't like who on the Cubs can hit home run. Oh, we'll get into that. We'll get into it, but it's Contreras right now is the answer, and that's about yeah, it. Yeah, and like uh, Rafael Ortega. Right. <laughs> They're so bad now. It's so awesome. Which, which you could be, you know, you could probably ask 12 Cub fans in Wrigley who Rafael Ortega is, and probably two of them would know. He doubled his home run total in one game by hitting three. Yeah. So, <laughs> hey, you know, you got to you gotta start somewhere, right? But – Yep. Uh, long story short, it's going to be a fun weekend. We can't wait for Sox Cubs. And then when they come back to play at, at guaranteed rate in August, you know, Zim's flying in from Colorado, you know, Vinny's going to try to meet up with us. It's going to be a blast. Uh, that this month is going to fly by just like that. So we can't wait for that, but you know, let's, let's take a quick dive into, you know, the week that is coming up. Let's talk about that week in a segment we like to call, White Sox Weekly. Yeah, so these guys get a heck of a week here. They stay at home for the next three days. 
Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday against the Royals. And then uh, they take a short little trek along the red line going up north to the friendly confines at Wrigley Field for a three-game set Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You know, it's been a long time since we've had back-to-back weekend series Cub Sox. I know last year is the first time that they had it on a weekend in quite some time, and both of them this time are. So I think we're going to see some some rowdiness out of, out of the fans, especially with uh, the way the Cubs have went from, I don't want to say this to be politically incorrect, but they technically went from zero to hero. Or, I mean, from hero to zero, sorry, backwards, in uh, the course of like 48 hours. But uh, there's going to be some high tensions, to put it lightly. So, Gonzo, I'm going to quickly toss it to you. And uh, as we do this, I am going to go ahead and bring up this schedule. And let's take a peek at it. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so it's easier for everybody to see. But uh, why don't you walk us through what's going on? Oh, yeah, no. You are, you uh, went through the, the the weekly schedule perfectly with Kansas City and the Cubs. Um, to start off with Kansas City, it's going to be a little different mix than last week um, of how you know both teams switch it up. But we're going to see Cease and Bubik go at it. Um, and I'm really expecting Cease to get after it again. Um, hopefully, shut them down. And uh, Giolito Hernandez for Game Two. Um, game Three. Oh, I did a little. Or uh, it's going to be uh, Keuchel and uh, Lynch on their team. Um, it's going to be an interesting series. Uh, I'll be disappointed if the Sox don't sweep them. I'll be honest. Um, Make up from your mistake from last week and get after it with these uh, with these Royals, um, and then for the weekend series, Rodon Hendricks, um, or I'll go back uh, the first game tomorrow. That's gonna be my game of the week, uh, Cease and Bubik. But then also first game of the Cubs series with Rodon and Hendricks. That's my game of the series for, for the pitching matchup. Um, then game two is Lynn and um, Alzaloy. And then game three, hopefully if they stick with it, it's going to be C's and Davies. Um, but I'll be perfect. I want to see two, two sweeps this week. That's what I want to see. That's my expectations. If anything less, I'm disappointed for what I see for this upcoming week. Um, granted, I know it. I know it might not I was going to say two things. That I want, one thing I want to bring up real quick, Gonzo, and get your thoughts on. is mm-hmm. You mentioned Friday. We're supposed to see Carlos Rodon. Um, obviously they had, you know, the spot start from Lambert yesterday, uh, to probably get rid on an extra day. Uh, is there any concern to you that it's still not in stone yet for who's starting on Friday? Cause I, I know it's a little out of the box, but they usually have the next four or so days or four games figured out. So for me, it's a little concerning that they don't have an official here. Uh, Vinny or Gonzo, do you, do you guys have any concerns with Carlos's health? Cause I heard that there's, some rumors flying around on Twitter, nothing official, that he's got some sort of dead arm. Uh, Vinny, have you heard anything about this specifically, or what are your thoughts? James Fagan didn't give me the answer that I wanted, but I've heard that they are looking to get Michael Kopeck a couple starts with the addition of Tapera and Kimbrel. Whether or not that comes true, it remains to be seen. But, I mean, imagine if they, like, allowed Michael to have a start against the Cubs. I mean, it would be sweet. I'm not expecting it, but I do think the door is open for it. And there are so many options that it wouldn't surprise me at all. I'm not really worried about Rodon. If he if he's got some issues that he's got to work through, let him work through him. We, we know when we actually need him. But, right. yeah, it is a little surprising that we don't know a single starter for the Cubs, but I assume – that we'll see if all healthy in it, you know, I think Gonzo said Rodon, Lynn, Cease, but if it goes in, if it goes Lynn, Cease, Rodon, or Lynn, Rodon, Cease, like there are a couple different options. I think Cease is guaranteed Sunday, considering that he's pitching tomorrow. I don't expect to see him Friday or Saturday, but the other two, if they flipped or if they used Michael or what if they call up Lambert again, if Rodon can't go, there are so many different options with this team and, it's not like did, – did you say they're going to face Kyle Hendricks? That's what it's looking like for game Friday? one. Yeah. Friday, right? Yeah. Wow. So 
we'll see what happens. The offense needs to be able to hit Kyle Hendricks, and then I think they should be able to take care of their business otherwise. I don't see a world where that lineup does too much damage against Lynn. I know it's baseball and weird things happen, and guys like Sebi Zavala and Rafael Ortega, the two most unlikely Chicago athletes to have three home runs, have three home runs on the same day. I mean, if Justin Fields put on either team's uniform and hit three home runs, I'd be less surprised than Rafael Ortega or Zebi Zavala doing it. <laughs> that's, that, that's a fair yeah. take, Vinny. <laughs> uh, um, and then and the, the other, the other... I was going to say, I didn't see any precursors with uh, Rodon's last outings with drop of velocity for, like, you know, a dead arm or anything. Um, he still could. I just didn't see any of those, like, precursors, of, you know, that you see with pitchers. Um, but hopefully, you know, if not rest them, like we've been doing with, you know, other players get them ready for um, the postseason. And I mean, to, I'm just happy to this point that he hasn't had to deal with any, you know, health in, injuries like we've for seen sure. in the past. So I'm just grateful um, with what we've seen out of Rodon this season. And his wife, his wife has been a little extra quiet on Twitter, social media in general lately. You know, I don't think that's necessarily a telltale sign either way, but you know, she's usually been super vocal. So uh, hopefully, hopefully Carlos is okay. Cause of course we all want to see him absolutely dominate. But um, one more thing when we, while we're talking about pitching before we moved on, we were talking a little bit about Dallas Keuchel pitching in Kansas city. You know, guys, I got to get your thoughts. Keuchel has not looked very good at all uh, over the last month, month and a half. Now this is a guy that likes to serve up solo shots. I think he served up, what he serve up three of them on, on Saturday, Vinny. So, I mean, you know, what are your concerns with Dallas right now? I, I know personally, you know, this is a guy that does not look the same. You know, what are you seeing, Vinny? I'm noticing something that I used to notice with Reynaldo Lopez back when he was an every everyday starter. Fine through the first through the first part of the order. Like through the order one time is what I was trying to say, but couldn't speak. Then he gets to the order the second time around. And they start to like knock him around a little bit. There's the one solo shot. And once he gives up that one solo shot, it's like, okay, when's the next one coming? When's the next one coming? And before you know it, he, Michael Kopech has to enter a dirty inning where he's tipping his pitches. And, you know, the game unravels from there. You know, the start, people don't realize how important to the bullpen the starter can actually be. It sets the tone. It's called a starter for a reason. And, I don't know. I, I have faith in Dallas if they had to use him as a bullpen piece in the playoffs. But I'm not going to sit here and act like he's one of my top four right now. Going into the playoffs, it would be Lynn, Giolito, Rodon, and Cease. And then Keiko might be a bullpen guy. Yeah, I was I was going to suggest that as well. I could see that being a real possibility here. I was kind of hoping that, that they were going to. we really got to talk about. I thought they were going to trade him at the deadline, um, clear up that cap space for next year, and uh, find you know something else and for, um, at the trade deadline. Uh, that's what I was kind of hoping well, for. Gonna ride him out. They're going to ride him out. Um, could be just veteran that he is. This is, this is his first full season in two years. Um, that could be affecting this picture for him. Um, he's a guy, that, you know. If he's going to need rest, getting ready for the postseason with the experience that he has, by all means, do so. Um, I'm not really worried about it just yet. Um, but, yeah, I, I see my rotation. I know I mentioned it last week at this moment is uh, Lynn Rodon and Cease. Um, still not sold on Giolito yet. Um, but, by all means, he can still take that over. Um, that's what we've got the next month to look at is who who that third starter is going to be giolito um, has the highest f war since the all-star break yep things to look into guys so many things to talk about you know these guys are set they, there's going to be a lot of tough decisions coming up let's just put it that way as we go into the playoffs so uh we got one more big segment before we get to the fun funny stuff at the end we got a couple of things to talk about but uh Let's take a dive into a hot topic conversation in a segment that we like to call the guaranteed take. Yay! Yeah, 
guys. So it was it was a hot topic day on White Sox Twitter today. Uh, I'm scrolling to find the tweet because uh, my mind was blown when this came out, and I'm not even seeing it anymore. Did he delete it? It was here before we started the show, but uh, we got to talk about it. I'll let you guys talk briefly as I see if I could find the graphic somewhere. What is Southside Showdown uh, Twitter? Ben Verlander. All right, I will pull it up as we speak, but Ben Verlander came out with his 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 MLB power rankings for Fox Sports top 10 and did not include the White Sox. Uh, Chris Gonzalez, I'll let you start things off here, man. Uh, what is going through Ben's brain? Because I can't seem to figure it out. I can't either. I mean, I'm not surprising more with the national media anymore. Um, it's just embarrassing. Um, like we've been talking about and harping about, they got the biggest lead in any division right now. 18 games above 500 plus, what was it, 113, 115 run differential. Um, one of the best records and home records in the league. Um, dominant rotation. I don't know, like what, why, why the media always has to leave us out. Um, I don't know if it will take one World Series or two World Series. I don't know what it will take for them to for the White Sox to get re- represented. Um, that's just flat out embarrassing, though, for baseball for the media not to give them representation. And maybe, maybe just maybe the Field of Dreams game. Although we'll probably hear it be all about the Yankees, probably, but. I'm hoping that the Field of Dreams game gives them some focus light here um, to go down the stretch here for the Sox. Yeah, it's a it's, it's a brutal take, and, and Vinny, I, I'll let you speak to it as well. But Ben Ben put these out, and he has three national well, not National League, but he's got one, two, two National League teams. He's got the Astros at two, and uh, you know he completely forgets the White Sox. And actually, if you go into this tweet chain, the White Sox themselves send a tweet here. 62 wins, best home record in baseball, plus 112 run differential. And then Ben comes out and says, full disclosure, I love you guys and love the team. And it was an accidental leave off the list. Most complete team in the AL. Uh, And then he was asked later, you know, where, I can't see where it is specifically, where he would place them. Twitter. Yeah. find her and he gives her like a, a real explanation like how it got messed up. <laughs> oh, I was ready for find real quick. Did you make this when you were drunk, Ben Furlander? Here's how I made this. I text my top 10 teams in order to our social team. I had the White Sox at five. I wanted them higher, deleted their name, went to correct the rest of the list, counted only nine teams, and added a tenth. Boom. So, so it's my a question, question of- for you, Vinny. Yeah. Go ahead. So my question for you is, why not just put this out again and correct it? Yeah. Um, if you're Fox, and let me just be very, very clear. I love when people click my stuff. I like when people are happy with my stuff. I like when people are mad at my stuff. Fox Sports got so much engagement. Look at the ratio on that. 901 retweets slash quote tweets. They're not deleting that if their life depended on it. They don't care that the White Sox are missing and it's a clear misrepresentation of an opinion. The amount of engagement they got on that tweet is so worth it. They might forget the Yankees next week or the Padres next. Like They might purposely leave off an elite team every week going forward now, and it wouldn't even slightly surprise me. I don't know if I believe Ben when he says this or if – because if it is true, it kind of makes me even more annoyed with him because, like, dude, like how many times do the White Sox have to be disrespected by national media for us to be like, all right, fine, we accept your apology. But at the same time, everybody knows the White Sox are a top-10 team. Everybody knows they're a top-5 team. They went – they haven't played the Giants. They're 2-4 and four against the – or 2-4 two and two and four against the Astros – haven't played the Dodgers. Two and one against the Rays. One and two against the Brewers. Two and two against the Red Sox. Haven't played the Daddies. Zero oh and three against the Yankees. Two and one against the Blue Jays. And they don't believe they've played the A's yet. 
So it's other than the Yankees, they're respect at least somewhat respectable against every team. The Brew Crew was tough, but that's a good team, and you know they they got their butts beat in Milwaukee that series. But everybody who watches baseball and has a realistic understanding of how it works and who's good and who's not knows that the White Sox are a very good team. They should be on that list. I would take them over most of those teams. I'm not so sure I would even have the Giants first personally, but they deserve respect and they got Bryant now. And I don't know. I can't believe that they allowed that to happen in the first place, but I understand why they didn't delete it. Yeah. And, and, and Gonzo, you know, I, I can see where they're coming from here, but at the same time, it's just so bad. Uh, I know it's got to be heaven for them to be getting this much engagement, but it's just a brutal take. And uh, yeah, I, that, that's really all I have to say about that. Um, it tells you a lot about the we, social media game that like engagement and all that kind of stuff means more than being accurate and not looking like a moron. Oh yeah, Absolutely. And uh, we did get a little bit of a breaking news tip here in the chat room uh, from Rob Farrell 11. He says, Luis Robert returns tomorrow. Check out his Instagram. It translates to, I got to say goodbye to the red bat now. And uh, I've actually gone ahead and pulled that Instagram post. Uh, Let's take a quick look at it. There it is. And it translates to, got to say goodbye to the red bat. It was liked by your mean Mercedes. Uh, it looks like Luis is on his way back, boys. As soon as tomorrow, uh, definitely probably before this Crosstown series. Uh, before we get to the fun little bit where after this, we're going to be talking about our favorite ballpark promotions. Uh, I'm just going to say I'm pumped up for the return of Luis Robert. Uh, I can't wait to see everyone healthy together again. I think these guys are ready to smash, and they're going to continue – to wreak havoc on the American League. Vinny, you look like you're as fired up as I am. Just give me your instant reaction. Uh, I'll put up this picture again if you want to look at it one more time. Yeah, so I'll always look at pictures of Luis Robert and smile. You can put a picture of him above my face anytime you want. When he comes back, that is just a major, major, major piece being added to the Starting lineup. He was just starting to get hot before he got hurt. The power wasn't really there, but, you know, the power really hasn't been there for anyone outside of Eloy. And, but the power will come for Robert. People forget he's only got, what is it, 80 games under his belt in the MLB. He doesn't even have half of a full MLB season under his belt. And the the injury, we'll see how it affects his running. And But they're not going to bring him up if they feel that there's an issue. That's just not how it's going to work. So they do have the roster spot open because they optioned Lambert and they did not call anybody up in his spot. And there were rumors today that it was going to be Jake Lamb, who apparently it could be if Robert isn't ready. But I don't know if Louise Roberts talking about saying goodbye to the Red Bat on the eve of a game with an empty roster spot after him being down there for two weeks. It is an interesting Instagram post. I will give you that. Um, I'm going to kind of temper my excitement just in case that you know, we've seen things on Instagram turn crazy in the last couple weeks. Sure, sure. So, you know, when I wake up tomorrow and I get that little tidbit that he's coming back, it'll certainly be exciting. Um, it's going to be a big boost to the team. It I, There's no other way around it. If if they're replacing Brian Goodwin, Sebi Zavala, and um, who am I forgetting here? Uh, Leary Garcia with... Eloy Jimenez, Luis Robert, and Yasmani Grandal. I mean, that's as good of an upgrade as any team in the league will ever get at any point. Yep. I'm with you, man. I'm, I'm pumped about it. And like I said, we'll take it with a grain of salt for now. Uh, but it is a very ominous post. We're not reporting that he is coming back 100%. Uh, but th- there is a, a growing feeling that he will be back very soon. Uh, I, I believe personally he'll be back before the Cubs series. But – We'll wait and see officially what happens. Hopefully, we get some good news tomorrow. But gents, we're we're gonna we're gonna end things in the show on on, on a fun note to talk because you know the White Sox have so many great promotional nights, right? Over the course of the season, I just got to find out. You know, I asked the chat room what's some of their favorite promotional nights, 
and we're going to talk a little bit about ours. So, you know, Vinny, I'll let you lead things off here, man. You and I are often on the same page with these things. And uh, you, I, I picked a slightly different one than you, but we're all in the same place with our heart. We're deep down inside. Tell me about your favorite promotional day at the ballpark. Yeah, so I've only been there a couple times during this promotion, but you know, as I'm older and I'm able to go to games a lot more, I will make it an annual event. I don't believe it's happened at any point this season so far, and I, or I think it did, and it was the the Lucas Giolito bobblehead in that theme. I don't know if it was actually this day, but it's Star Wars night, and Star Wars is really cool. If you like yes. Star Wars, you are cool. Nerds don't like Star Wars. Agreed. Cool people like Star Wars. That's that's absolute and fact. Darth Vader is the most evil villain in the history of cinema, and nobody can convince me otherwise. That makes him cool. And it's just really cool when they play the music and they got the guys dressed up and, you know, they, they play the, the music at the beginning of the game as if it's an episode of the movie and they play a crawl that describes the upcoming game. And it's just a lot of fun. If you like Star Wars, you got Boba Fett there, old school, you know, Star. everyone likes Star Wars. It's a classic. So... Shout out to Joey and his bad Star Wars opinions. Um, I like Star Wars night. We should all go sometime. Bring our lightsabers. Oh, I could do that. You know, I you know I can. You know, I got a few of them to spare. Always do. <laughs> oh yeah. If mine was in reach of me right now, I'd do it. But I would have to get up. That's for sure. And you know, there, there's always so many things that the White Sox do. You know, Brooks Boyer, amazing what he does. It It's especially cool to see, you know, how they honor players of the past and players, you know, that are going to the Hall of Fame. And I know, Gonzo, that's kind of where yours goes to, right? So talk a little bit about, you know, your favorite kind of promotional nights. My favorite promotional nights are the ones um, bringing back the former players for their achievements. I mean, they've done it with Burley. They've done it with Canerco. They've done it with Scott Pacenic. And hence, you know, Bert, or Joe's got the Scott Pacenic bobblehead that I gave him that was signed by Burley. Or not Burley, Scott Pacenic when I went down there and um, got it signed by him. And he'll fish it out for you, everybody, to see you there. And there you go. Um, but my all time favorite, as everyone probably knows in the chat, is uh, Jim Tomey. And uh, it was a gift of mine by one of my uh, college friends sent me tickets to go to that ceremony and, and see it. And I took pictures of Tommy at the podium. And uh, I was there for so many White Sox games where he had just, you know, a couple multi home run games by him and just a lot of amazing moments to watch. Um, and even one, you know, games I wasn't there. I know Joe can talk about his. Um, blackout game home run that he hit. Um, oh, just yeah. so many, so many great moments. Uh, not even just the player, but him. I got to meet him, and he's he's everything you hear about him. Completely humble guy, high character. I'm sure Vaughn, you know, helps him with his mem- you know, mentorship. Um, where he's going to be going in the future with the White Sox, but this guy, his reason is he's a Sox ambassador. And uh, I loved his uh, the night that the Sox, you know, held for him and his family. Yeah, and, and the coolest thing about the whole thing is not only the way the White Sox honor their past players, but on these promotional nights, they also usually give them, give the fans something to commemorate that Hall of Fame induction. Mm-hmm. You know, for, for Tommy, it was a Hall of Fame plaque, a mini plaque. They did the same thing for, for ben, uh, Frank Thomas. You know, it's just totally cool, and they have this whole day dedicated to a player. And I think that's really special, and the White Sox do a, a knockout job with the way they handle all of that. So, yeah, props, his, props to – He had his own Hall of Fame bobblehead. He had his own Hall of Fame bobblehead for that game too. So it was it was nice to see. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they, they do Hall of Fame bobbleheads, Hall of Fame plaques. I mean, they, they, have, the great, they have great handouts – I mean, I'll just show off a couple. I mean, when Vinny, I, Vinny and I went to the game on Saturday, and my dad was there with me. Uh, you know, it was Yoan Mankata bobblehead night. You know, this is a great promotion. It's a beautiful bobblehead. It's really well made. You know, the detail on it is unreal. He's even got the little, you know, white white rag he wears under his head. You can see the detail in the jersey. 
He's even got a look at this. He's got a finger coming out of the mitt. I mean, that's just cool, man. I know it's little things like that, but the details are awesome. And then, you know, White Sox charities. This isn't a giveaway, but you can get this in the park. Hawk Harrelson goes in the Hall of Fame. You know, I got a Hawk Harrelson all gold bobblehead with with white shoes. I mean, they they do really amazing promotions at the park. You know, this is really cool stuff that the White Sox do year after year. And uh, I'm just impressed with the promotions. And, and, and that brings me to talking about my favorite promotion. And, you know, it, it it's none other than Elvis night. You know, they have a night at the end of the game. Elvis's parachute in. They land on the field out of a plane. It's absolutely wild. Then they have an Elvis impersonator, you know, come out. And here he is. Then they have the fireworks show in the background. And then they have an Elvis impersonator with dancers. You know, they come out and then there's a, there's a concert. Let me see if I can find him in this video here. Yeah, there's the go-go dancers. Yeah, here comes the king himself, if this ever wants to load. But, you know, there he is. He comes out. You know, people go absolutely nuts. They sell, they sell the Elvis sunglasses. You can buy wigs, you know, sideburns. It's just, it's an amazing time. Friday night of this past week was Elvis night. It never fails to disappoint in this park. Brooks Boyer and crew do an outstanding job. And I, I know all of Major League Baseball does amazing events, but the White Sox have always, you know, from Disco Demolition, we had Jeff Schwartz all those years ago to, you know, all the weird in, events in between. But I tell you what, there's one thing at the end of the day, the White Sox know how to put a good promotion out there. And, you know, Elvis Knight is just my favorite, not because I'm just an Elvis fan, but because, you know, you can see, 20 or 30, maybe 40 people dressed in Elvis jumpsuits in the stands and the seats. You know, it's just, you know, it's, it's a lifestyle, especially when you check out Elvis night. If you haven't been to an Elvis night, I highly recommend you do in the future, but uh, just a little a something fun. Game to this year. What's that Vinny? It was a sick game this year. Wasn't it Friday night? Yeah, sure was. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah. They found, Good find a way to win, get it done. And, you know, they just always have a fun time. So, uh, like I said, there's fun events. The ballpark, they do a great job there. I know, you know, my dad my, my dad mentioned that he likes going to superhero night. They have themes. You know, all the players are photo, photoshopped on the screen to be on superhero bodies. They do that on Elvis night, too. They have rock and roll night, country music night, you know, Polish heritage night. You can name it. They, they do it all. It's, it's, it's amazing stuff. And our buddy Chubb says it looks like they hired them from East Fremont in Vegas. Um, yeah, I think that's partially the point. And I know Fremont's, you know, I know that's supposed to be a dig. But, yeah, it's, it's much more fun when you're there in person and you see it in action. Um, so that's absolutely fun. Uh, I do have to point out a comment that Chubb's made earlier, Vinny, to get your response. Because I know he's here to, to stir the pot a little bit. And I got to get your reaction. Uh, he says, as a Cubs fan, I have to say I give credit to Vinny for getting me to watch the show. Just because I can't wait to see him in October go crazy when the Sox lose full-on meltdown style. Uh, that sounds like someone that just lost all the core players on a uh, Cubs team that, you know, unfortunately unloaded at the trade deadline. Yeah, as I weep in my sorrows for R Bryant, Rizzo, and Baez all hitting home runs in their first games with their new teams, I'm glad that Chubbs thinks of me in his free time and wants <laughs> – to come here and hear me talk about my favorite team while thinking about them melting down two months from now. I said earlier in the show that they might not win the world series. Winning the world series is freaking hard, but I am going to hit my yes. pillow tonight, not even slightly thinking about Chubbs. And I'm going to think more about how my team is the best professional sports organization in the city of Chicago. And it's really not close. The second is the hopes of Justin Fields or Seth Jones. And I'm not going to lose my mind if they lose in the playoffs. The Astros are very good. The Red Sox are very good. So I got nothing for you, Chubbs. I'm happy you think of me, and thank you for supporting the show. Yeah, and he says excuse, he says you're exactly right. I'm at the low point as a Cubs fan. I want to see Vinny lose this consolation. Well, to be fair, it would be all of us because because we're all in on this team. You know, we're, we're fans, and that's what this is all about. And, you know, we're not here to hate on the Cubs. You know, I have family that works in, in all the ballparks. I worked at Cubs at Wrigley Field all the way through college. 
you know, I don't have any ill will against the Cubs. You know, I have a show I designed to support both teams. Exactly. And, you know, and that's what we do. And at the end of the day, our show specifically, this show, South Burbs Hitman, is devo- devoted to the White Sox. We're just speaking the truth. You know, this team, obviously, with the bullpen the way they are, with the starters the way they are, with this team coming back to full strength, is poised to make a deep postseason run. Now, I will admit it, Vinny, if we get if we get through there and we don't get to that point, yes, I will be drastically disappointed, as will all the guys on the show, yourself included. But you know, we can't we can't dwell on that. We just got to be excited for what can happen. Uh, baseball is full season, and that's all we could do. If the White Sox win the World Series, though, you know what's going to happen. Chubbs is going to be nowhere to be found. He's not going to come face me. He, you know, he wouldn't come video chat with me. I just know for a fact that he would cower away if the White Sox actually did win the World Series. And then there's no chance that he would ever, you know, man up to it. Yeah, he goes, you know, and he says, I never hated the White Sox, still don't hate the Cardinals, just know Vinny hates the Cubs or seems to really relish in our you don't misery. Hate the Cardinals? What do you mean you don't hate the Cardinals? What? That's crazy. I don't like the Minnesota. Well, anyway. The thing about us, though, our division rivals are different. We don't have that one division rival um, that we hate. Like, it's just whoever's the second best or the biggest thorn in our side at that point in time. Yeah, I think he's absolutely. getting us mixed up because I'm the one that loves watching the Cubs in misery. No, I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm the guy. I'm the guy. If Chubbs wants to know me, I'm the guy rooting for Cleveland in the World Series versus the Cubs. Oh, I was too, but you know, trust me, Chubbs. I don't want you on my show. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, he says you want to help him promote him. I don't know. Yeah. But at the end of the day, Chubbs, regardless, we appreciate you tuning in, Chubbs, because a view is a view at the end of the day. And we yep. know you support a lot of the other shows on the network. So the fact that you're hanging out with us, even though you're not a Sox fan, uh, is more than we can speak volumes to. So I think Vinny and I agree. Thank you. And Vinny's got one more point to make. Yeah, Chubbs, if he wants to check out my Cubs content to see how unbiased of a baseball journalist I am, I have an article coming out tomorrow morning on the three mistakes that led to them trading away all their star players last week. So unbiased. And, stuff and, there you go. and Chubbs, unbiased. your favorite Bra- Greg Braggs will be with us shortly in the next coming week. So you can enjoy more Cubs with us. And uh, I'm sure Braggs will talk about the Bears and so the Cubs at that point in the season. So it is what it is. For sure. The Cubs for might sure. trade and- Braggs to this show for a 30th <laughs> prospect. That's right. It could happen. But he wanted to clarify he hates the Cardinals. So oh, God, anyway, God. that's beside the point. I read it right. So, but anyway, we do appreciate you, Chubbs, regardless. And uh, I'll, I'll apologize in advance for the beating that the Northsiders will get this weekend. I feel drastically confident that we're going to do well. But honestly, I do feel really bad for Cub fans. I couldn't imagine if our core was just one day gone. It um, will be. You know, it, this will happen. It will be. It and I, it, it'll team. suck. That's why, like him saying that we're going to have a meltdown in the playoffs if they lose, like one team wins the World Series. One of the Astros, Rays, Dodgers, White Sox, and the Padres, they're falling off a cliff. But you get one of my point. One team is going to win. Yeah, for sure. But I do want to talk a little bit about next week's show because we got a great show coming up, guys. Before we do shout outs, we have the White Sox 13th round draft pick catcher Colby Smelly joining us on the show next week. Uh, exciting young prospect. Obviously, you know, we love hearing about catchers because, you know, the White Sox right now they have catching issues and, you know, every team really does. There's not a lot of great hitting catchers in the league. So I'm excited to talk to Kobe next week. I know they're doing some training out in Arizona. So uh, he sounds like he's going to be able to join us. If not, if the last minute he can't join us, he will definitely be joining us in the coming weeks. But right now the plan is for Kobe Smelly to join us next week. So that's going to be super exciting. Can't wait to talk about that and see what he's got going on in his life, uh, being a young player, getting drafted into Major League Baseball. So that's going to be awesome. Stay tuned next week for that. And uh, at the end of the day, guys, it's time for shout-outs. We, we had a bit of a long show, but I do want to thank James Fagan again from The Athletic for joining us, giving us so much great insight and so much of his time. Uh, make sure you follow him at Jr. Fagan on Twitter, 
uh, and Instagram. He's got the same tag. And then, of course, check out The Athletic. Uh, subscribe over there for all that great content. It's really cool stuff. But let's get the shout-outs. Uh, Chris Gonzalez, I'll let you lead things off. You know, what do you got, my friend? Yeah, I got a couple shout-outs. Um, I'm going to shout-out Travis for – I know family comes first, but we appreciate you coming late. Um, totally understandable. We enjoy having you every week. I'm um, always in the chat. And heck for the, I know we talked about it for the past five minutes, but shout out to you, Chubbs. Um, there's one thing positive I can say is I believe that Hoyer fleeced us with Madrigal um, in that deal. Um, we can get back to that later on, but congrats to you, Chubbs. You got a good second baseman for the future. And uh, I'm going to shout out my parents and my girlfriend for all their love and support as well. Um, and that is my shout outs for this week. I love it, man. I absolutely love it. How about, how about you, Vinny? What do you got? Well, it's always my parents and brother, you know, supporting me throughout all this. Um, it's been a rough summer, but you know, we're pulling through and, uh, you know, just my family. It's been a good stretch here for me on the professional level. So I appreciate everybody who's supported along the way and, you know, with this show and everything that's going on and, you know, just thank you. That's awesome, Vinny. Yeah. We appreciate you. And, and if anyone who doesn't know, Vinny's got great content out there make sure you follow him and check out his articles. You know, he's all over the place, you know, Southside showdown fan sided, just go to his Twitter. You'll, you'll see it all. And, and of course he's on this show, Crosstown Crosstalk on the barroom network and as well as bar down uh, Blackhawks, lots of Blackhawks news lately. It's crazy. So Vinny's got all the Chicago sports stuff that you need. Uh, for my shout-outs, I, of course, always shout-out my wife, Catherine, and my, my dog, Maverick. He's a great Dane, so I love those guys. And you know, I want to give a special shout-out to, to Gabriel Rocky Silva. Uh, I got to meet up with, with Gabriel. Uh, he likes to go by Rocky as well. Uh, outside of Gate 5 before the game on Saturday, you know, we got the, the talk, meet in person. You got to know the guy a little bit. He's a great guy. Uh, he's a big supporter of ours, so I want to give you a huge shout-out, Gabriel. I appreciate you hanging with us all the time. I also want to shout out my dad, uh, who I got to go to the ball game with on Saturday. Uh, one of the best ball games I ever saw in my life. Back and forth, eight home runs. Just y- y- the games don't get much better than that at the end of the day. So it's a ton of fun. Uh, Gabriel says, Thanks, man. Yeah, no problem, Gabriel. It was fun getting to meet you. Um, and then my dad, of course. Great show tonight, guys. Great interview with James Vegan. Go, Sox. Yeah, we appreciate that, and we appreciate everyone that hangs out. Ron Rupp now. You got, you know, all these great guys in the chat. You know, we have uh, uh, Rob Farrell that was in there, Travis. Uh, who else Who else am I missing? Our boy Rocky, uh, Adam Shum. I mean, the list goes on and on. I, I can't thank you guys enough for supporting our show and everything that we do. Uh, huge shout-out, not what Gonzo thought he heard, but – We'll go ahead and, and leave that behind the doors. But uh, it's been a great show, guys. So much fun. And uh, let's see here. Yeah, uh, my dad also says, uh, Davini, it was a pleasure meeting you at the game on Saturday as well. So uh, shout out to Vinny and Twelve for getting to hang out with my dad for a few minutes. And Likewise. And to Very nice to meet you. Absolutely, man. And uh, it's been a heck of a show, guys. Gonzo, you got one more thing to say? I can see you got, you got your tongue ready to rock. I was going to say, I thought I saw a fantasy football goon uh, give us a little chat question, too. I don't yeah, know what that's about. Shout out, shout out to the fantasy football goon. Uh, for those of our viewers and listeners that don't know, I also do a fantasy football show here on the Barroom Network. And uh, surprise, surprise, football season's sneaking up. And uh, that show will be back here very soon. Uh, we'll be live you know, during football season every Sunday morning before the games to walk you through your lineup decisions and everything you need to know. So make sure you follow at FFB goon on Twitter as well. Uh, and check out fantasy for all your needs, but it's going to be a fun season and there's a lot of fantasy football coming up too. So a uh, quick shameless plug, but uh, Gonzo set it up for me. So I, I don't feel so bad about it. And uh, Chubb says he gave you a follow Vinny. So thank you, Chubbs. Vinny got the two thumbs up. Hi mom. We'll say hi mom. We'll say thanks Cubs. And uh, we're looking forward to a great week. Hopefully, Luis Robert comes back this week, maybe tomorrow. We'll see what happens. But uh, it's going to be a fun series. The boys going to keep the bats rolling, keep the pitching hot. That bullpen is primed and ready to rock. And for the South Burbs Hitmen, I am Joe Mandel. 
That's Vinny Parisi. And that guy down there is Chris Gonzalez. We will see you guys next week. Uh, Kobe Smelly, 13th round draft pick of the White Sox. A catcher will be joining us. It's going to be a blast. Again, a huge thank you to James Fegan from The Athletic for being our amazing guest tonight. We'll see you guys next week. Go White Sox and go drink an ice cold beer because it's a beautiful night. We'll see you guys then. And yeah, that's what Vinny's has to say. Later, alligator. And uh, we'll see you then. Bye.